Naked Empire, The Sword of Truth, Book 8, by Terry Goodkind. Read by Nick Sullivan. This book contains 667 pages. Chapter 1. You knew they were there, didn't you? Kaylin asked in a hushed tone as she leaned closer. Against the darkening sky, she could just make out the shapes of three black-tipped races taking to wing, beginning their nightly hunt. That was why he'd stopped. That was what he'd been watching as the rest of them waited in uneasy silence. Yes, Richard said. He gestured over his shoulder without turning to look. There are two more back there. Kaylin briefly scanned the dark jumble of rock, but she didn't see any others. Lightly grasping the silver pommel with two fingers, Richard lifted his sword a few inches, checking that it was clear in its scabbard. A last fleeting glimmer of amber light played across his golden cape as he let the sword drop back in place. In the gathering gloom of dusk, his familiar, tall, powerful contour seemed as if it were no more than an apparition made of shadows. Just then, two more of the huge birds shot by right overhead. One, wing stretched wide, let out a piercing scream as it banked into a tight gliding turn, circling once in assessment of the five people below, before stroking its powerful wings to catch its departing comrades in their swift journey west. This night, they would find ample food. Kalen expected that as Richard watched them, he was thinking of the half-brother that until just recently he hadn't known existed. That brother now lay a hard day's travel to the west in a place so naked to the burning sun that few people ever ventured there. Fewer still ever returned. The searing heat, though, had not been the worst of it. Beyond those desolate lowlands, the dying light silhouetted a remote rim of mountains, making them look as if they had been charred black by the furnace of the underworld itself. As dark as those mountains, as implacable, as perilous, the flight of five pursued the departing light. Jensen, standing to the far side of Richard, watched in astonishment. What in the world? Black-tipped races, Richard said. Jensen mulled over the unfamiliar name. I've often watched hawks and falcons and such, she said at last, but I've never seen any birds of prey that hunt at night other than owls, and these aren't owls. As Richard watched the races, he idly gathered small pebbles from the crumbling jut of rock beside him, rattling them in a loose fist. I'd never seen them before either until I came down here. People we've spoken with say they began appearing only in the last year or two depending on who's telling the story. Everyone agrees, though, that they never saw the races before then. Last couple of years, Jensen wondered aloud. Almost against her will, Kaylin found herself recalling the stories they'd heard, the rumors, the whispered assertions. Richard cast the pebbles back down the hard pan trail. I believe they're related to falcons, Jensen finally crouched to comfort her brown goat, Betty, pressing up against her skirts. They can't be falcons. Betty's little white twins, usually either capering, suckling, or sleeping, now huddled mute beneath their mother's round belly. They're too big to be falcons. They're bigger than hawks, bigger than golden eagles. No falcon is that big. Richard finally withdrew his glare from the birds and bent to help console the trembling twins. One, eager for reassurance, anxiously peered up at him, licking out its little pink tongue before deciding to rest a tiny black hoof in his palm. With a thumb, Richard stroked the kid's spindly, white-haired leg. A smile softened his features as well as his voice. Are you saying you choose not to see what you've just seen, then? Jensen smoothed Betty's drooping ears. I guess the hair standing on end at the back of my neck must believe what I saw. Richard rested his forearm across his knee as he glanced toward the grim horizon. The races have sleek bodies with round heads and long pointed wings similar to all the falcons I've seen. Their tails often fan out when they soar, but otherwise are narrow in flight. Jensen nodded, seeming to recognize his description of relevant attributes. To Kalen, a bird was a bird. These, though, with red streaks on their chests and crimson at the base of their flight feathers, 
she had come to recognize. They're fast, powerful, and aggressive, Richard added. I saw one easily chase down a prairie falcon and snatch it out of midair in its talons. Jensen looked to be struck speechless by such an account. Richard had grown up in the vast forests of Westland and had gone on to be a woods guide. He knew a great deal about the outdoors and about animals. Such an upbringing seemed exotic to Kalen, who had grown up in a palace in the Midlands. She loved learning about nature from Richard, loved sharing his excitement over the wonders of the world, of life. Of course, he had long since come to be more than a woods guide. It seemed a lifetime ago when she'd first met him in those woods of his, but in fact it had only been little more than two and a half years. Now they were a long way from Richard's simple boyhood home or Kalen's grand childhood haunts. Had they a choice, they would choose to be in either place or just about anywhere else other than where they were, but at least they were together. After all she and Richard had been through, the dangers, the anguish, the heartache of losing friends and loved ones, Kalen jealously savored every moment with him, even if it was in the heart of enemy territory. In addition to only just finding out that he had a half-brother, they had also learned that Richard had a half-sister, Jensen. From what they had gathered since they'd met her the day before, she too had grown up in the woods. It was heartwarming to see her simple and sincere joy at having discovered a close relation with whom she had much in common. Only her fascination with her new big brother exceeded Jensen's wide-eyed curiosity about Kalen and her mysterious upbringing in the Confessor's palace in the far-off city of Aidendrill. Jensen had a different mother than Richard, but the same brutal tyrant Darken Rall had fathered them both. Jensen was younger, just past twenty, with sky-blue eyes and ringlets of red hair down onto her shoulders. She had inherited some of Darken Rall's cruelly perfect features, but her maternal heritage and guileless nature altered them into bewitching femininity. While Richard's raptor gaze attested to his Rall paternity, his countenance and his bearing, so manifest in his gray eyes, were uniquely his own. I've seen falcons rip apart small animals, Jensen said. I don't believe I much like thinking about a falcon that big, much less five of them together. Her goat, Betty, looked to share the sentiment. We take turns standing watch at night, Kalen said, answering Jensen's unspoken fear. While that was hardly the only reason, it was enough. In the eerie silence, withering waves of heat rose from the lifeless rock all around. It had been an arduous day's journey out from the center of the valley wasteland and across the surrounding flat plain, but none of them complained about the brutal pace. The torturous heat, though, had left Kalen with a pounding headache. While she was dead tired, she knew that in recent days Richard had gotten far less sleep than any of the rest of them. She could read that exhaustion in his eyes, if not in his stride. Kalen realized then what it was that had her nerves so on edge. It was the silence. There were no yips of coyotes, no howls of distant wolves, no flutter of bats, no rustle of a raccoon, no soft scramble of a vole, not even the buzz and chirp of insects. In the past, when all those things went silent, it had meant potential danger. Here, it was dead silent because nothing lived in this place. No coyotes or wolves or bats or mice or even bugs. Few living things ever trespassed this barren land. Here the night was as soundless as the stars. Despite the heat, the oppressive silence ran a chill shiver up through Kalen's shoulders. She peered off once more at the races, barely still visible against the violet blush of the western sky. They, too, would not stay long in this wasteland where they did not belong. Kind of unnerving to encounter such a menacing creature when you never even knew such a thing existed, Jensen said. She used her sleeve to wipe sweat from her brow as she changed the subject. I've heard it said that a bird of prey wheeling over you at the beginning of a journey is a warning. Kara, until then content to remain silent, leaned in past Kalen. Just let me get close enough and I'll pluck their wretched feathers. Long blonde hair, pulled back into the traditional single braid of her profession,
framed Kara's heated expression. We'll see how much of an omen they are then. Kara's glare turned as dark as the races whenever she saw the huge birds. Being swathed from head to foot in a protective layer of gauzy black cloth, as were all of them except Richard, only added to her intimidating presence. When Richard had unexpectedly inherited rule, he had been further surprised to discover that Kara and her sister Mord Sith were part of the legacy. Richard returned the little white kid to its watchful mother and stood, hooking his thumbs behind his multi-layered leather belt. At each wrist, wide leather padded silver bands bearing linked rings and strange symbols seemed to gather and reflect what little light remained. I once had a hawk circle over me at the beginning of a journey. And what happened? Jensen asked earnestly, as if his pronouncement might settle once and for all the old superstition. Richard's smile widened into a grin. I ended up marrying Kalen. Kara folded her arms. That only proves it was a warning for the Mother Confessor, not you, Lord Rall. Richard's arm gently encircled Kalen's waist. She smiled with him as she leaned against his embrace in answer to the wordless gesture. That that journey had eventually brought them to be husband and wife seemed more astonishing than anything she would ever have dared dream. Women like her, confessors, dared not dream of love. Because of Richard, she had dared and had gained it. Kalen shuddered to think of the terrible times she had feared he was dead or worse. There had been so many times she had ached to be with him, to simply feel his warm touch, or to even be granted the mercy of knowing he was safe. Jensen glanced at Richard and Kalen to see that neither took Kara's admonition as anything but fond heckling. Kalen supposed that to a stranger, especially one from the land of Dahara, as was Jensen, Kara's jibes at Richard would defy reason. Guards did not bait their masters, especially when their master was the Lord Rall, the master of Dahara. Protecting the Lord Rall with their lives had always been the blind duty of the Mord Sith. In a perverse way, Kara's irreverence toward Richard was a celebration of her freedom, paid in homage to the one who had granted it. By free choice, the Mord Sith had decided to be Richard's closest protectors. They had given Richard no say in the matter. They often paid little heed to his orders unless they deemed them important enough. They were, after all, now free to pursue what was important to them, and what the Mord Sith considered important above all else was keeping Richard safe. Over time, Kara, their ever-present bodyguard, had gradually become like family. Now that family had unexpectedly grown. Jensen, for her part, was awestruck to find herself welcomed. From what they had so far learned, Jensen had grown up in hiding, always fearful that the former Lord Rall, her father, would finally find her and murder her, as he murdered any other ungifted offspring he found. Richard signaled to Tom and Friedrich, back with the wagon and horses, that they would stop for the night. Tom lifted an arm in acknowledgment and then set to unhitching his team. No longer able to see the races in the dark void of the western sky, Jensen turned back to Richard. I take it their feathers are tipped in black. Before Richard had a chance to answer, Kara spoke in a silken voice that was pure menace. They look like death itself drips from the tips of their feathers, like the keeper of the underworld has been using their wicked quills to write death warrants. Kara loathed seeing those birds anywhere near Richard or Kalen. Kalen shared the sentiment. Jensen's gaze fled Kara's heated expression. She redirected her suspicion to Richard. Are they causing you some kind of trouble? Kalen pressed a fist to her abdomen against the ache of dread stirred by the question. Richard appraised Jensen's troubled eyes. The races are tracking us. Chapter 2 Jensen frowned. What? Richard gestured between Kalen and himself. The races. They're tracking us. You mean they followed you out into this wasteland and they're watching you? Waiting to see if you'll die of thirst or something so they can pick your bones clean? Richard slowly shook his head. No. I mean they're following us. Keeping track of where we are. 
I don't understand how you can possibly know. We know, Kara snapped. Her shapely form was as spare, as sleek, as aggressive looking as the races themselves. And, swathed in the black garb of the nomadic people who sometimes traveled the outer fringes of the vast desert, just as sinister looking. With the back of his hand against her shoulder, Richard gently eased Kara back as he went on. We were looking into it when Friedrich found us and told us about you. Jensen glanced over at the two men back with the wagon. The sharp sliver of moon floating above the black drape of distant mountains provided just enough light for Kalin to see that Tom was working at removing the trace chains from his big draft horses while Friedrich unsaddled the others. Jensen's gaze returned to search Richard's eyes. What have you been able to find out so far? We never had a chance to really find out much of anything. Oba, our surprise half-brother lying dead back there, kind of diverted our attention when he tried to kill us. Richard unhooked a water skin from his belt. But the races are still watching us. He handed Kaylin his water skin, since she had left hers hanging on her saddle. It had been hours since they had last stopped. She was tired from riding and weary from walking when they had needed to rest the horses. Kaylin lifted the water skin to her lips only to be reacquainted with how bad hot water tasted. At least they had water. Without water, death came quickly in the unrelenting heat of the seemingly endless barren expanse around the forsaken place called the Pillars of Creation. Jensen slipped the strap of her water skin off her shoulder before hesitantly starting again. I know it's easy to misconstrue things. Look at how I was tricked into thinking you wanted to kill me just like Dark and Rahl had. I really believed it. And there were so many things that seemed to me to prove it, but I had it all wrong. I guess I was just so afraid it was true I believed it. Richard and Kaylin both knew it hadn't been Jensen's doing. She had merely been a means for others to get at Richard, but it had squandered precious time. Jensen took a long drink. Still grimacing at the taste of the water, she lifted the water skin toward the empty desert behind them. I mean, there isn't much alive out here. It might actually be that the races are hungry and are simply waiting to see if you die out here, and because they do keep watching and waiting, you've begun to think it's more. She gave Richard a demure glance, bolstered by a smile, as if hoping to cloak the admonishment as a suggestion. Maybe that's all it really is. They aren't waiting to see if we die out here, Kaylin said, wanting to end the discussion so they could eat and Richard could get some sleep. They were watching us before we had to come here. They've been watching us since we were back in the forest to the northeast. Now, let's have some supper and... But why? That's not the way birds behave. Why would they do that? I think they're keeping track of us for someone, Richard said. More precisely, I think someone is using them to hunt us. Kalin had known various people in the Midlands, from simple people living in the wilds to nobles living in great cities, who hunted with falcons. This, though, was different. Even if she didn't fully understand Richard's meaning, much less the reasons for his conviction, she knew he hadn't meant it in the traditional sense. With abrupt realization, Jensen paused in the middle of another drink. That's why you've started scattering pebbles along the wind-blown places in the trail. Richard smiled in confirmation. He took his water skin when Kalin handed it back. Kara frowned up at him as he took a long drink. You've been throwing pebbles along the trail? Why? Jensen eagerly answered in his place. The open rock gets blown clean by the wind. He's been making sure that if anyone tries to sneak up on us in the dark, the pebbles strewn across those open patches will crunch underfoot and alert us. Kara wrinkled a questioning brow at Richard. Really? He shrugged as he passed her his water skin so that she wouldn't have to dig hers out from beneath her desert garb. Just a little extra precaution in case anyone is close and careless. Sometimes people don't expect the simple things and that catches them up. But not you, Jensen said, hooking the strap of her water skin back over her shoulder. You think of even the simple things. Richard chuckled softly. If you think I don't make mistakes, Jensen, you're wrong. While it's dangerous to assume that those who wish you harm are stupid, 
It can't hurt to spread out a little gravel just in case someone thinks they can sneak across windswept rock in the dark without being heard. Any trace of amusement faded as Richard stared off toward the western horizon where stars had yet to appear. But I fear that pebbles strewn along the ground won't do any good for eyes watching from a dark sky. He turned back to Jensen, brightening, as if remembering he had been speaking to her. Still, everyone makes mistakes. Kara wiped droplets of water from her sly smile as she handed Richard back his water skin. Lord Rawl is always making mistakes, especially simple ones. That's why he needs me around. Is that right, little Miss Perfect? Richard chided as he snatched the water skin from her hand. Maybe if you weren't helping me out of trouble, we wouldn't have black-tipped races shadowing us. What else could I do? Kara blurted out. I was trying to help to protect you both. Her smile had withered. I'm sorry, Lord Rawl. Richard sighed. I know, he admitted as he reassuringly squeezed her shoulder. We'll figure it out. Richard turned back to Jensen. Everyone makes mistakes. How a person deals with their mistakes is a mark of their character. Jensen nodded as she thought it over. My mother was always afraid of making a mistake that would get us killed. She used to do things like you did, in case my father's men were trying to sneak up on us. We always lived in forests, though, so it was dry twigs rather than pebbles that she often scattered around us. Jensen pulled on a ringlet of her hair as she stared off into dark memories. It was raining the night they came. If those men stepped on twigs, she wouldn't have been able to hear it. She ran trembling fingers over the silver hilt of the knife at her belt. They were big, and they surprised her. But still, she got one of them before they... Dark and Rawl had wanted Jensen dead because she had been born ungifted. Any ruler of that bloodline killed offspring such as she. Richard and Kalin believed that a person's life was their own to live and that birth did not qualify that right. Jensen's haunted eyes turned up to Richard. She got one of them before they killed her. With one arm, Richard pulled Jensen into a tender embrace. They all understood such terrible loss. The man who had lovingly raised Richard had been killed by Darkin Rawl himself. Darkin Rawl had ordered the murders of all of Kalin's sister confessors. The men who had killed Jensen's mother, though, were men from the Imperial Order sent to trick her, to murder in order to make her believe it was Richard who was after her. Kalin felt a forlorn wave of helplessness at all they faced. She knew what it was to be alone, afraid, and overwhelmed by powerful men filled with blind faith and the lust for blood, men devoutly believing that mankind's salvation required slaughter. I'd give anything for her to know that it wasn't you who sent those men. Jensen's soft voice held the dejected sum of what it was to have suffered such a loss, to have no solution to the crushing solitude it left in its wake. I wish my mother could have known the truth, known what you two are really like. She's with the good spirits and finally at peace, Kalin whispered in sympathy. Even if she now had reason to question the enduring validity of such things. Jensen nodded as she swiped her fingers across her cheek. What mistake did you make, Kara? she finally asked. Rather than be angered by the question, and perhaps because it had been asked in innocent empathy, Kara answered with quiet candor. It has to do with that little problem we mentioned before. You mean it's about the thing you want me to touch? By the light of the moon's narrow crescent, Kalin could see Kara's scowl return. And the sooner, the better. Richard rubbed his fingertips across his brow. I'm not sure about that. Kalin, too, thought that Kara's notion was too simplistic. Kara threw her arms up. But Lord Rawl, we can't just leave it. Let's get camp set up before it's pitch dark, Richard said in quiet command. What we need right now is food and sleep. For once, Kara saw the sense in his orders and didn't object. When he had earlier been out scouting alone, she had confided in Kalin that she was worried at how weary Richard looked and had suggested that since there were enough other people, they shouldn't wake him for a turn at watch that night. I'll check the area, Kara said. 
and make sure there aren't any more of those birds sitting on the rock watching us with those black eyes of theirs. Jensen peered around as if fearing that a black-tipped race might swoop in out of the darkness. Richard countermanded Kara's plans with a dismissive shake of his head. They're gone for now. You said they were tracking you, Jensen stroked Betty's neck when the goat nudged her, seeking comfort. The twins were still hiding under their mother's round belly. I never saw them before now. They weren't around yesterday or today. They didn't show up until just this evening. If they really were tracking you, then they wouldn't be gone for such a stretch. They'd have to stick close to you all the time. They can leave us for a time in order to hunt, or to make us doubt our suspicion of their true intent, and even if we keep going, they can easily find us when they return. That's the advantage the black-tipped races have. They don't need to watch us every moment. Jensen planted her fists on her hips. Then how in the world could you possibly be sure they're tracking you? She flicked a hand out toward the darkness beyond. You often see the same kind of birds. You see ravens, sparrows, geese, finches, hummingbirds, doves. How do you know that any of them aren't following you and that the black-tipped races are? I know, Richard said as he turned and started back toward the wagon. Now let's get our things out and set up camp. Kalen caught Jensen's arm as she headed after him, about to renew her objections. Let him be for tonight, Jensen, Kalen lifted an eyebrow. Please? About this, anyway. Kalen was pretty sure that the black-tipped races really were following them, but it wasn't so much an issue of her being sure of it herself. Rather, she had confidence in Richard's word in matters such as this. Kalen was versed in affairs of state, protocol, ceremony, and royalty. She was familiar with various cultures, the origins of ancient disputes between lands, and the history of treaties. And she was conversant in any number of languages, including the duplicitous dialect of diplomacy. In such areas, Richard trusted her word when she expressed her convictions. In matters about something so odd as strange birds following them, she knew better than to question Richard's word. Kalen knew, too, that he didn't yet have all the answers. She had seen him like this before, distant and withdrawn, as he struggled to understand the important connections and patterns and relevant details only he perceived. She knew that he needed to be left alone about it. Pestering him for answers before he had them only served to distract him from what he needed to do. Watching Richard's back as he walked away, Jensen finally forced a smile of agreement. Then, as if struck with another thought, her eyes widened. She leaned close to Kalen and whispered, Is this about magic? We don't know what it's about. Jensen nodded. I'll help. Whatever I can do, I want to help. For the time being, Kalen kept her worries to herself as she circled an arm around the young woman's shoulders in an appreciative embrace and walked her back toward the wagon. Chapter 3 In the immense silent void of night, Kalen could clearly hear Friedrich off to the side speaking gently to the horses. He patted their shoulders or ran a hand along their flanks each time on his way by as he went about grooming and picketing them for the night. With darkness shrouding the empty expanse beyond, the familiar task of caring for the animals made the unfamiliar surroundings seem a little less forbidding. Friedrich was an older, unassuming man of average height. Despite his age, he had undertaken a long and difficult journey to the old world to find Richard. Friedrich had undertaken that journey, carrying with him important information soon after his wife had died. The terrible sadness of that loss still haunted his gentle features. Kalen supposed that it always would. In the dim light, she saw Jensen smile as Tom looked her way. A boyish grin momentarily overcame the big, blonde-headed Daharan when he spotted her, but he quickly bent back to work, pulling bedrolls from a corner beneath the seat. He stepped over supplies in his wagon and handed a load down to Richard. There's no wood for a fire, Lord Rawl. Tom rested a foot on the chafing rail, laying a forearm over his bent knee. But if you like, I have a little charcoal to use for cooking. What I'd really like is for you to stop calling me Lord Rawl. 
If we're anywhere near the wrong people and you slip up and call me that, we'll all be in a great deal of trouble. Tom grinned and patted the ornate letter R on the silver handle of the knife at his belt. Not to worry, Lord Rawl. Steel against steel. Richard sighed at the oft-repeated maxim involving the bond of the Daharan people to their Lord Rawl and he to them. Tom and Friedrich had promised they wouldn't use Richard's and Kalin's titles around other people. A lifetime's habits were difficult to change, though, and Kalin knew that they felt uncomfortable not using titles when they were so obviously alone. So, Tom said as he handed down the last bedroll, would you like a small fire for cooking? Hot as it is, it seems to me we could do without any more heat, Richard set the bedrolls atop a sack of oats already unloaded. Besides, I'd prefer not to take the time. I'd like to be on our way at first light, and we need to get a good rest. Can't argue with you there, Tom said, straightening his big frame. I don't like us being so out in the open, where we could easily be spotted. Richard swept his hand in a suggestive arc across the dark vault above. Tom cast a wary eye skyward. He nodded reluctantly before turning back to the task of digging out tools to mend the breaching and wooden buckets to water the horses. Richard put a boot on a spoke of the cargo wagon's stout rear wheel and climbed up to help. Tom, a shy but cheerful man who had appeared only the day before, right after they'd encountered Jensen, looked to be a merchant who hauled trade goods. Hauling goods in his wagon, Kalen and Richard had learned, gave him an excuse to travel where and when he needed as a member of a covert group whose true profession was to protect the Lord Rawl from unseen plots and threats. Speaking in a low voice, Jensen leaned closer to Kalen. Vultures can tell you from a great distance where a kill lies, by the way they circle and gather, I mean. I guess I can see how the races could be like that. Birds that someone could spot from afar in order to know there was something below. Kalen didn't say anything. Her head ached, she was hungry, and she just wanted to go to sleep, not to discuss things she couldn't answer. She wondered how many times Richard had viewed her own insistent questions in the same way she now viewed Jensen's. Kalen silently vowed to try to be at least half as patient as Richard always was. The thing is, Jensen went on matter-of-factly, how would someone get birds to, well, you know, circle around you like vultures over a carcass in order to know where you were? Jensen leaned in again and whispered, so as to be sure that Richard wouldn't hear. Maybe they're sent with magic to follow specific people. Kara fixed Jensen with a murderous glare. Kalen idly wondered if the moored Sith would clobber Richard's sister or extend her leniency because she was family. Discussions about magic, especially in the context of its danger to Richard or Kalen, made Kara testy. Mord Sith were fearless in the face of death, but they did not like magic and weren't shy about making their distaste clear. In a way, such hostility toward magic characterized the nature and purpose of Mord Sith. They were singularly able to appropriate the gifted's power and use it to destroy them. Mord Sith had been mercilessly trained to be ruthless at their task. It was from the madness of this duty that Richard had freed them. It seemed obvious enough to Kalen, though, that if the races really were tracking them, it would have to involve conjuring of some sort. It was the questions raised by that assumption that so worried her. When Kalen didn't debate the theory, Jensen asked, Why do you think someone would be using the races to track you? Kalen lifted an eyebrow at the young woman. Jensen, we're in the middle of the old world. Being hunted in enemy territory is hardly surprising. I guess you're right, Jensen admitted. It just seems that there would have to be more to it. Despite the heat, she rubbed her arms as if a chill had just run through her. You have no idea how much Emperor Jagang wants to catch you. Kalen smiled to herself. Oh, I think I do. Jensen watched Richard a moment as he filled the buckets with water from barrels carried in the wagon. Richard leaned down and handed one to Friedrich. Ears turned attentively ahead, the horses all watched, eager for a drink. Betty, also watching as her twins suckled, bleated her longing for a drink. After filling the buckets, Richard submerged his water skin to fill it too. 
Jensen shook her head and looked again into Kalen's eyes. Emperor Jagang tricked me into thinking Richard wanted me dead. She glanced briefly over at the men engaged in their work before she went on. I was there with Jagang when he attacked Aiden Drill. Kalen felt as if her heart came up in her throat at hearing first-hand confirmation of that brute invading the place where she'd grown up. She didn't think she could bear to hear the answer, but she had to ask. Did he destroy the city? After Richard had been captured and taken from her, Kalen, with Kara at her side, had led the Daharan army against Jagang's vast invading horde from the Old World. Month after month, Kalen and the army fought against impossible odds, retreating all the way up through the Midlands. By the time they lost the battle for the Midlands, it had been over a year since Kalen had seen Richard. He had seemingly been cast into oblivion. When at last she learned where he was being held, Kalen and Kara had raced south to the old world only to arrive just as Richard ignited a firestorm of revolution in the heart of Jagang's homeland. Before she'd left, Kalen had evacuated Aidendrill and left the Confessor's palace empty of all those who called it home. Life, not a place, was what mattered. He never got a chance to destroy the city, Jensen said. When we arrived at the Confessor's palace, Emperor Jagang thought he had you and Richard cornered. But out in front waited a spear holding the head of the Emperor's revered spiritual leader, Brother Narav. Her voice lowered meaningfully. Jagang found the message left with the head. Kalin remembered well the day Richard had sent the head of that evil man, along with a message for Jagang on the long journey north. Compliments of Richard Rawl. That's right, Jensen said. You can't imagine Jagang's rage. She paused to be certain Kalin heeded her warning. He'll do anything to get his hands on you and Richard. Kalin hardly needed Jensen to tell her how much Jagang wanted them. All the more reason to get away, hide somewhere, Kara said. And the races, Kalin reminded her. Kara cast a suggestive look at Jensen before speaking in a quiet voice to Kalin. If we do something about the rest of it, maybe that problem would go away, too. Kara's goal was to protect Richard. She would be perfectly happy to put him in a hole somewhere and board him over if she thought doing so would keep harm from reaching him. Jensen waited, watching the two of them. Kalin wasn't at all sure there was anything Jensen could do. Richard had thought it over and had come to have serious doubts. Kalen had been amply skeptical without Richard's doubts. Still, maybe, was all she said. If there's anything I can do, I want to try it, Jensen fussed with a button on the front of her dress. Richard doesn't think I can help. If it involves magic, wouldn't he know? Richard is a wizard. He would know about magic. Kalen sighed. There was so much more to it. Richard was raised in Westland, far from the Midlands, even farther from Dahara. He grew up in isolation from the rest of the New World, never knowing anything at all about the gift. Despite all he's so far learned and some of the remarkable things he's accomplished, he still knows very little of his birthright. They had already told Jensen this, but she seemed skeptical, as if she suspected there was a certain amount of exaggeration in what they were telling her about Richard's unfamiliarity with his own gift. Her big brother had, after all, in one day rescued her from a lifetime of terror. Such a profound awakening probably seemed tangled in magic to one so devoid of it. Perhaps it was. Well, if Richard is as ignorant of magic as you say, Jensen pressed in a meaningful voice, finally having arrived at the heart of her purpose, then maybe we shouldn't worry so much about what he thinks. Maybe we should just not tell him and go ahead and do whatever it is Kara wants me to do to fix your problem and get the races off your backs. Nearby, Betty contentedly licked clean her little white twins. The sweltering darkness and vast weight of the surrounding silence seemed as eternal as death itself. Kalen gently took a hold of Jensen's collar. I grew up walking the corridors of the wizard's keep and the confessor's palace. I know a lot about magic. She pulled the young woman closer. I can tell you that such naive notions, when applied to ominous matters like this, can easily get people killed. 
there is always the possibility that it's as simple as you fancy, but most likely it's complex beyond your imagination, and any rash attempt at a remedy could ignite a conflagration that would consume us all. Added to all that is the grave peril of not knowing how someone such as yourself, someone so pristinely ungifted as to be forewarned of in that ancient book Richard has, might affect the equation. There are times when there is no choice but to act immediately. Even then it must be with your best judgment, using all your experience and everything you do know. As long as there is a choice, though, you don't act in matters of magic unless you can be sure of the consequence. You don't ever just take a stab in the dark. Kalin knew all too well the terrible truth of such an admonition. Jensen seemed unconvinced. But if he doesn't really know much about magic, his fears might only be, I've walked through dead cities, walked among the mutilated bodies of men, women, and children the Imperial Order has left in their wake. I've seen young women not as old as you make thoughtless, innocent mistakes and end up chained to a stake to be used by gangs of soldiers for days before being tortured to death just for the amusement of men who get sick pleasure out of raping a woman as she's in the throes of death. Kaylin gritted her teeth as memories flashed mercilessly before her mind's eye. She tightened her grip on Jensen's collar. All of my sister confessors died in such a fashion, and they knew about their power and how to use it. The men who caught them knew, too, and used that knowledge against them. My closest girlhood friend died in my arms after such men were finished with her. Life means nothing to people like that. They worship death. Those are the kind of people who butchered your mother. Those are the kind of people who will have us, too, if we make a mistake. Those are the kind of people laying traps for us, including traps constructed of magic. As for Richard not knowing about magic, there are times when he is so ignorant of the simplest things that I can scarcely believe it and must remind myself that he grew up not being taught anything at all about his gift. In those things I try to be patient and to guide him as best I can. He takes very seriously what I tell him. There are other times when I suspect that he actually grasps complexities of magic that neither I nor anyone alive has ever before fathomed or even so much as imagined. In those things, he must be his own guide. The lives of a great many good people depend on us not making careless mistakes, especially careless mistakes with magic. As the mother confessor, I'll not allow reckless whim to jeopardize all those lives. Now, do you understand me? Kaylin had nightmares about the things she had seen, about those who had been caught, about those who had made a simple mistake and paid the price with their life. She was not many years beyond Jensen's age, but right then that gulf was vastly more than a mere handful of years. Kaylin gave Jensen's collar a sharp yank. Do you understand me? Wide-eyed, Jensen swallowed. Yes, Mother Confessor. Finally, her gaze broke toward the ground. Only then did Kaylin release her. Chapter 4 Anyone hungry? Tom called to the three women. Richard pulled a lantern from the wagon, and after finally getting it lit with a steel and flint, set it on a shelf of rock. He passed a suspicious look among the three women as they approached, but apparently thought better of saying anything. As Kalin sat close at Richard's side, Tom offered him the first chunk he sliced from a long length of sausage. When Richard declined, Kalin accepted it. Tom sliced off another piece and passed it to Kara and then another to Friedrich. Jensen had gone to the wagon to search through her pack. Kalin thought that maybe she just wanted to be alone a moment to collect herself. Kaylin knew how harsh her words had sounded, but she couldn't allow herself to do Jensen the disservice of coddling her with pleasing lies. With Jensen reassuringly close by, Betty lay down beside Rusty, Jensen's red roan mare. The horse and the goat were fast friends. The other horses seemed pleased by the visitor and took keen interest in her two kids, giving them a good sniff when they came close enough. When Jensen walked over displaying a small piece of carrot, 
Betty rose up in a rush. Her tail went into a blur of expectant wagging. The horses whinnied and tossed their heads, hoping not to be left out. Each in turn received a small treat and a scratch behind the ears. Had they a fire, they could have cooked a stew, rice, or beans, griddled some bannock, or maybe have made a nice soup. Despite how hungry she was, Kaylin didn't think she would have had the energy to cook, so she was content to settle for what was at hand. Jensen retrieved strips of dried meat from her pack, offering them around. Richard declined this too, instead eating hard travel biscuits, nuts, and dried fruit. But don't you want any meat? Jensen asked as she sat down on her bedroll opposite him. You need more than that to eat. You need something substantial. I can't eat meat, not since the gift came to life in me. Jensen wrinkled her nose with a puzzled look. Why would your gift not allow you to eat meat? Richard leaned to the side, resting his weight on an elbow as he momentarily surveyed the sweep of stars, searching for the words to explain. Balance in nature, he said at last, is a condition resulting from the interaction of all things in existence. On a simple level, look at how predators and prey are in balance. If there were too many predators and the prey were all eaten, then the thriving predators too would end up starving and dying out. The lack of balance would be deadly to both prey and predator. The world for them both would end. They exist in balance because acting in accordance with their nature results in balance. Balance is not their conscious intent. People are different. Without our conscious intent, we don't necessarily achieve the balance that our survival often requires. We must learn to use our minds to think if we're to survive. We plant crops, we hunt for fur to keep us warm, or raise sheep and gather their wool and learn how to weave it into cloth. We have to learn how to build shelter. We balance the value of one thing against another and trade goods to exchange what we've made for what we need that others have made or grown or built or woven or hunted. We balance what we need with what we know of the realities of the world. We balance what we want against our rational self-interest not against fulfilling a momentary impulse, because we know that our long-term survival requires it. We use wood to build a fire in the hearth in order to keep from freezing on a winter night, but despite how cold we might be when we're building the fire, we don't build the fire too big, knowing that to do so would risk burning our shelter down after we're warm and asleep. But people also act out of short-sighted selfishness, greed, and lust for power. They destroy lives. Jensen lifted her arm out toward the darkness. Look at what the Imperial Order is doing and succeeding at. They don't care about weaving wool or building houses or trading goods. They slaughter people just for conquest. They take what they want. And we resist them. We've learned to understand the value of life, so we fight to reestablish reason. We are the balance. Jensen hooked some of her hair back behind an ear. What does all this have to do with not eating meat? I was told that wizards, too, must balance themselves, their gift, their power, in the things they do. I fight against those, like the Imperial Order, who would destroy life because it has no value to them, but that requires that I do the same terrible thing by destroying what is my highest value, life. Since my gift has to do with being a warrior, abstinence from eating meat is believed to be the balance for the killing I'm forced to do. What happens if you eat meat? Kaylin knew that Richard had cause from only the day before to need the balance of not eating meat. Even the idea of eating meat nauseates me. I've done it when I've had to, but it's something I avoid if at all possible. Magic deprived of balance has grave consequences, just like building a fire in the hearth. The thought occurred to Kaylin that Richard carried the sword of truth and perhaps that weapon also imposed its own need for balance. Richard had been rightly named the Seeker of Truth by the first wizard himself, Zedekus Zul Zarander, Zed, Richard's grandfather, the man who had helped raise him and from whom Richard had additionally inherited the gift. Richard's gift had been passed down not only from the Rall bloodline, but the Zarander as well. Balance indeed. Rightly named seekers had been carrying that very same sword for nearly 3,000 years. 
Perhaps Richard's understanding of the need for balance had helped him to survive the things he'd faced. With her teeth, Jensen tugged off a strip of dried meat as she thought it over. So, because you have to fight and sometimes kill people, you can't eat meat as the balance for that terrible act? Richard nodded as he chewed dried apricots. It must be dreadful to have the gift, Jensen said in a quiet voice. To have something so destructive that it requires you to balance it in some way. She looked away from Richard's gray eyes. Kalen knew what a difficult experience it sometimes was to meet his direct and incisive gaze. I used to feel that way, he said. When I first was named the Seeker and given the sword, and even more so later when I learned that I had the gift, I didn't want to have the gift, didn't want the things the gift could do, just as I hadn't wanted the sword because of the things in me that I thought shouldn't ever be brought out. But now you don't mind as much having the sword or the gift? You have a knife and have used it. Richard leaned toward her, holding out his hands. You have hands. Do you hate your knife or hands? Of course not. But what does that have to do with having the gift? Having the gift is simply how I was born, like being born male or female, or with blue or brown or green eyes, or with two hands. I don't hate my hands because I could potentially strangle someone with them. It's my mind that directs my hands. My hands don't act of their own accord. To think so is to ignore the truth of what each thing is, its true nature. You have to recognize the truth of things if you're to achieve balance or come to truly understand anything for that matter. Kalen wondered why she didn't require balance the way Richard did. Why was it so vital for him but not for her? Despite how much she wanted to go to sleep, she couldn't keep silent. I often use my confessor's power for that same end, to kill, and I don't have to keep in balance by not eating meat. The Sisters of the Light claim that the veil that separates the world of the living from the world of the dead is maintained through magic. More precisely, they claim that the veil is here, Richard said, tapping the side of his temple, in those of us who have the gift, wizards and, to a lesser extent, sorceresses. They claim that balance for those of us with the gift is essential because in us, within our gift, resides the veil making us, in essence, the guardians of the veil, the balance between worlds. Maybe they're right. I have both sides of the gift, additive and subtractive. Maybe that makes it different for me. Maybe having both sides makes it more important than usual for me to keep my gift in balance. Kalen wondered just how much of that might be true. She feared to think how extensively the balance of magic itself had been altered by her doing. The world was unraveling in more ways than one, but there had been no choice. Kara dismissively waggled a piece of dried meat before them. All this balance business is just a message from the good spirits in that other world telling Lord Raal to leave such fighting to us. If he did, then he wouldn't have to worry about balance or what he can and can't eat. If he would stop putting himself in mortal danger, then his balance would be just fine and he could eat a whole goat. Jensen's eyebrows went up. You know what I mean, Kara grumbled. Tom leaned in. Maybe Mistress Kara is right, Lord Rall. You have people to protect you. You should let them do it, and you could better put your abilities to the task of being the Lord Rall. Richard closed his eyes and rubbed his temples with his fingertips. If I had to wait for Kara to save me all the time, I'm afraid I'd have to do without a head. Kara rolled her eyes at his wisp of a smile and went back to her sausage. Studying his face in the dim light as he sucked on a small bite of dried biscuit, Kalen thought that Richard didn't look well and that it was more than simply being exhausted. The soft glow of light from the lantern lit one side of his face, leaving the rest in darkness, as if he were only half there, half in this world and half in the world of darkness as if he were the veil between. She leaned close and brushed back the hair that had fallen across his forehead, using the excuse to feel his brow. He felt hot, but they were all hot and sweating, so she couldn't really tell if he had a fever, but she didn't think so. Her hand slipped down to cup his face, 
kindling his smile. She thought she could lose herself in the pleasure of just looking into his eyes. It made her heart ache with joy to see his smile. She smiled back, a smile she gave no one but him. Kalin had an urge to kiss him, too, but there always seemed to be people around, and the kind of kiss she really wanted to give him wasn't the kind of kiss you gave in front of others. It seems so hard to imagine, Friedrich said to Richard. I mean, the Lord Ra himself not knowing about the gift as he grew up. Friedrich shook his head. It seems so hard to believe. My grandfather, Zed, has the gift, Richard said as he leaned back. He wanted to help raise me away from magic, much like Jensen, hidden away where Dark and Rao couldn't get at me. That's why he wanted me raised in Westland, on the other side of the boundary from magic. And even your grandfather, a wizard, never let on that he was gifted? Tom asked. No, not until Kalin came to Westland. Looking back on it, I realized that there were a lot of little things that told me he was more than he seemed, but growing up I never knew. He just always seemed wizardly to me in the sense that he seemed to know about everything in the world around us. He opened up that world for me, making me want to all the time know more. But the gift wasn't ever the magic he showed me. Life was what he showed me. It's really true then, Friedrich said, that Westland was set aside to be a place without magic. Richard smiled at the mention of his home of Westland. It is. I grew up in the Heartland Woods, right near the boundary, and I never saw magic. Except maybe for Chase. Chase? Tom asked. A friend of mine, a boundary warden. Fellow about your size, Tom. Whereas you serve to protect the Lord Rawl, Chase's charge was the boundary, or rather keeping people away from it. He told me that his job was keeping away the prey, people, so that the things that come out of the boundary wouldn't get any stronger. He worked to maintain balance, Richard smiled to himself. He didn't have the gift, but I often thought that the things that man could pull off had to be magic. Friedrich, too, was smiling at Richard's story. I lived in Dahara all my life. When I was young, those men who guarded the boundary were my heroes, and I wanted to join them. Why didn't you? Richard asked. When the boundary went up, I was too young. Friedrich stared off into memories, then sought to change the subject. How much longer until we get out of this wasteland, Lord Rall? Richard looked east, as if he could see off into the black of night beyond the dim circle of lantern light. If we keep up our pace a few more days and we'll be out of the worst of it, I'd say. It gets rockier now as the ground continues to rise up toward the distant mountains. The traveling will be more difficult, but at least as we get higher, it shouldn't be quite so hot. How far is this thing that, that Kara thinks I should touch? Jensen asked. Richard studied her face a moment. I'm not so sure that's a good idea. But we are going there? Yes. Jensen picked at the strip of dried meat. What is this thing that Kara touched anyway? Kara and Kaelin don't seem to want to tell me. I asked them not to tell you, Richard said. But why? If we're going to see it, then why wouldn't you want to tell me what it is? Because you don't have the gift, Richard said. I don't want to influence what you see. Jensen blinked. What difference could that make? I haven't had time to translate much of it yet, but from what I gather from the book Friedrich brought me, even those who don't have the gift in the common sense have at least some tiny spark of it. In that way, they are able to interact with the magic in the world, much like you must be born with eyes to see color. Being born with eyes, you can see and understand a grand painting, even though you may not have the ability to create such a painting yourself. The gifted Lord Rao gives birth to only one gifted heir. He may have other children, but rarely are any of them ever also gifted. Still, they do have this infinitesimal spark, as does everyone else. Even they, so to speak, can see color. The book says, though, that there are rare offspring of a gifted Lord Rawl like you who are born devoid of any trace whatsoever of the gift. The book calls them pillars of creation. Much like those born without eyes can't perceive color, those born like you can't perceive magic. 
But even that is imprecise, because with you, it's more than simply not perceiving magic. For someone born blind, color exists, they just aren't able to see it. For you, though, it isn't that you simply can't perceive magic. For you, magic does not exist. It isn't a reality. How is such a thing possible? Jensen asked. I don't know, Richard said. When our ancestors created the bond of the Lord Rawl to the Daharan people, it carried the unique ability to consistently bear a gifted air. Magic needs balance. Maybe they had to make it work like this, have this counter of those born like you in order for the magic they created to work. Maybe they didn't realize what would happen and inadvertently created the balance. Jensen cleared her throat. What would happen if, you know, if I were to have children? Richard surveyed Jensen's eyes for what seemed a painfully long time. You would bear offspring like you. Jensen sat forward, her arms reflecting her emotional entreaty. Even if I marry someone with that spark of the gift? Someone able to perceive color, as you called it? Even then, my child would be like me? Even then and every time, Richard said with quiet certitude. You are a broken link in the chain of the gift. According to the book, once the line of all those born with the spark of the gift, including those with the gift as it is in me, going back thousands of years, going back forever, is broken, it is broken for all time. It cannot be restored. Once forfeited in such a marriage, no descendant of that line can ever restore the link to the gift. When these children marry, they too would be as you, breaking the chain in the line of those they marry. Their children would be the same, and so on. That's why the Lord Rawl always hunted down ungifted offspring and eliminated them. You would be the genesis of something the world has never had before, those untouched by the gift. Every offspring of every descendant would end the line of the spark of the gift in everyone they married. The world, mankind, would be changed forever. This is the reason the book calls those like you pillars of creation. The silence seemed brittle. And that's what this place is called too, Tom said as he pointed a thumb back over his shoulder, seeming to feel the need to say something into the quiet. The pillars of creation. He looked at the faces surrounding the weak light coming from the sputtering lantern. Seems a strange coincidence that both those like Jensen and this place would be called the same thing. Richard stared off into the darkness toward that terrible place where Kalin would have died had he made a mistake with the magic involved. I don't think it's a coincidence. They are connected somehow. The book, The Pillars of Creation, describing those born like Jensen, was written in the ancient language of Hai Daharan. Few people still living understood Hai Daharan. Richard had begun to learn it in order to unravel important information in other books they'd found that were from the time of the Great War. That war, extinguished 3,000 years before, had somehow ignited once again and was burning uncontrolled through the world. Kalen feared to think of the central, if inadvertent, part she and Richard had played in making it possible. Jensen leaned in as if looking for some thread of hope. How do you think the two might be connected? Richard let out a tired sigh. I don't know yet. With a finger, Jensen rolled a pebble around in a small circle, leaving a tiny rut in the dust. All of those things about me being a pillar of creation... Being the break in the link of the gift makes me feel somehow dirty. Dirty? Tom asked, looking hurt to hear her even suggest such a thing. Jensen, why would you feel that way? Those like me are also called holes in the world. I guess I can see why now. Richard leaned forward, resting his elbows on his knees. I know what it's like to feel regret for how you were born for what you have or don't have. I hated being born the way I was with the gift, but I came to realize how senseless such feelings are, how completely wrong it was to think that way. 
But it's different with me, she said, as she pushed at the sand with a finger, erasing the little ruts she'd made with the pebble. There are others like you, wizards or sorceresses, with the gift. Everyone else can at least see colors, as you put it. I'm the only one like this. Richard gazed at his half-sister, a beautiful, bright, ungifted half-sister that any previous Lord Rawl would have murdered on the spot and was overcome with a radiant smile. Jensen, I think of you as born pure. You're like a new snowflake, different than any other, and startlingly beautiful. Looking up at him, Jensen was overcome with a smile of her own. I never thought of it that way. Her smile withered as she thought about his words. But still, I'd be destroying... You would be creating, not destroying, Richard said. Magic exists. It cannot possess the right to exist. To think so would be to ignore the true nature, the reality of things. People, if they don't take the lives of others, have the right to live their life. You can't say that because you were born with red hair, you supplanted the right of brown hair to be born on your head. Jensen giggled at such a concept. It was good to see the smile taking firmer hold. By the look on Tom's face, he agreed. So, Jensen finally asked, what about this thing we're going to see? If the thing Kara touched has been altered by someone with the gift, then since you can't see the magic, you might see something we can't see, what lies beneath that magic. Jensen rubbed the edge of her boot heel. And you think that will tell you something important? I don't know. It may be useful or it may not, but I want to know what you see with your special vision without any suggestion from us. If you're so worried about it, why did you leave it? Aren't you afraid someone might come across it and take it? I worry about a lot of things, Richard said. Even if it really is something altered by magic and she sees it for what it truly is, Kara said, that doesn't mean that it still isn't what it seems to us or that it isn't just as dangerous. Richard nodded. At least we'll know that much more about it. Anything we learn might help us in some way. Kara scowled. I just want her to turn it back over. Richard gave her a look designed to keep her from saying anything else about it. Kara huffed, leaned in, and took one of Richard's dried apricots. She scowled at him as she popped the apricot into her mouth. As soon as supper was finished, Jensen suggested that they pack all the food safely back in the wagon so that Betty wouldn't help herself to it in the night. Betty was always hungry. At least with her two kids, she now had a taste of what it was like to be badgered for food. Kaylin thought that Friedrich should be given consideration because of his age, so she asked him if he'd like to take first watch. First watch was easier than being awakened in the middle of the night to stand watch between stretches of sleep. He smiled his appreciation as he nodded his agreement. After opening his and Kaylin's bedroll, Richard doused the lantern. The light was sweltering but crystal clear so that after Kaylin's eyes adjusted, the sweep of stars was enough to see by, if not very well. One of the white twins thought the newly unfurled bedrolls would be a perfect place to romp. Kaylin scooped up the leggy bundle and returned it to its tail-wagging mother. As she lay down beside Richard, Kaylin saw the dark shape of Jensen curl up by Betty and collect the twins in the tender bed of her arms where they quickly settled down. Richard leaned over and gently kissed Kaylin's lips. I love you, you know. If we're ever alone, Lord Rawl, Kaylin whispered back, I'd like to have more than a quick kiss. He laughed softly and kissed her forehead before lying on his side away from her. She had been expecting an intimate promise, or at least a light-hearted remark. Kaylin curled up behind him and rested a hand on his shoulder. Richard, she whispered, are you all right? It took him longer to answer than she would have liked. I have a splitting headache. She wanted to ask what kind of headache, but she didn't want the tiny spark of fear she harbored to gain the glow of credence by voicing it aloud. It's different from the headaches I had before, Richard said, as if in answer to her thoughts. I suppose it's this wicked heat on top of not having had any sleep for so long. I suppose. 
Kaylin bunched up the blanket she was using for a pillow to make a lump that would press against the sore spot at the base of her skull. The heat is making my head pound, too. She gently rubbed the back of his shoulder. Have a good sleep, then. She was exhausted and aching all over, and it felt delicious to lie down. Her head felt better, too, with the soft lump of blanket pressed against the back of her neck. With her hand resting against Richard's shoulder, feeling his slow breathing, Kaylin fell into a dead sleep. Chapter 5 As tired as she was, it was a marvelous sensation being beside Richard and letting herself go, letting her concerns and worries go for the time being, and so effortlessly sinking into sleep but the sleep seemed only just started when she woke to find Kara gently shaking her shoulder. Kaylin blinked up at the familiar silhouette standing over her. She ached to go back to sleep, to be left alone, to be so wonderfully asleep again. My watch? Kaylin asked. Kara nodded. I'll stand it if you'd like. Kaylin glanced over her shoulder as she sat up, seeing that Richard was still fast asleep. No, she whispered. You get some sleep. You need rest, too. Kaylin yawned and stretched her back. She took Kara's elbow and pulled her a short distance away out of earshot and leaned close. I think you're right. There's more than enough of us to stand watch and all still get enough rest. Let's let Richard sleep till morning. Kara smiled her agreement before heading for her bedroll. Conspiracy designed to protect Richard suited the Mord Sith. Kaylin yawned and stretched again, at the same time forcing herself to shake the lingering haze of sleep from her mind to be alert. Pulling her hair back from her face and flipping it over her shoulder, she scanned the wasteland all around, looking for anything out of the ordinary. Everything beyond their camp was as still as death. Mountains blacked out the glittering sweep of stars in a jagged line all the way around the horizon. Kaylin took careful assessment of everyone, making sure they were all accounted for. Kara already looked comfortable. Tom slept not far from the horses. Friedrich was asleep on the other side of the horses. Jensen was curled up beside Betty, but by her movements, the way she turned from her side to her back didn't look asleep. The babies had moved and now lay sprawled with their heads butted up tight against their mother. Kaylin was always especially vigilant right at change of watch. Change of watch was a prime time for attack. She knew, for she had often initiated raids around change of watch. Those just going off watch were often tired and already thinking of other things, considering watch the duty of the next guard. Those just coming on watch were often not mentally prepared for a sudden attack. People tended to think that the enemy would not come until they were properly settled in and on the lookout. Victory favored those who were ready. Defeat stalked those who were unwary. Kaylin made her way to a formation of rock not far from Richard. She scooted back, sitting atop a high spot in order to get a better view of the lifeless surroundings. Even in the middle of the night, the rough rock still radiated the fierce heat of the previous day. Kaylin pulled a skein of damp hair away from her neck, wishing there were a breeze. There had been times in winter when she had nearly frozen to death. Try as she might, she couldn't seem to recall what it felt like to be truly cold. It wasn't long after Kaylin had gotten herself situated before she saw Jensen get up and step quietly through their camp, trying not to wake the others. All right if I sit with you, she asked when she finally reached Kaylin. Of course. Jensen pushed her bottom back up onto the rock beside Kaylin, pulled her knees up, and wrapped her arms around them, hugging them close to her body. For a time, she just gazed out at the night. Kaylin, I'm sorry about before. Despite the dark, Kaylin thought she could see that the young woman looked miserable. I didn't mean to sound like a fool who would do something without thinking. I'd never do anything to hurt any of you. I know you wouldn't deliberately do any such thing. It's the things you might do unwittingly that concern me. Jensen nodded. I think I understand a little better now about how complicated everything is and how much I really don't know. I'll not do anything, 
unless you or Richard tells me to. I promise. Kaylin smiled and ran a hand down the back of Jensen's head, letting it come to rest on her shoulder. I only told you those things because I care about you, Jensen. She gave the shoulder a compassionate squeeze. I guess I'm worried for you the same way Betty worries for her innocent twins, knowing the dangers all around when they rarely do. You need to understand that if you go out on thin ice, it doesn't matter if the lake was frozen over by a cold spell or a magic spell. If you don't know where you're stepping, so to speak, you could fall into the cold, dark arms of death. It matters not what made the ice. Dead is dead. My point is that you don't go out on that thin ice unless you have a very powerful need, because it very well could cost you your life. But I'm not touched by magic. Like Richard said, I'm like someone born without eyes who can't see color. I'm a broken link in the chain of magic. Wouldn't that mean that I can't accidentally get into trouble with it? And if someone pushes a boulder off a cliff and it crushes you, does it matter if that boulder was sent crashing over the edge by a man with a lever or by a sorceress wielding the gift? Jensen's voice took on a troubled tone. I see what you mean. I guess that I never looked at it that way. I'm only trying to help you because I know how easy it is to make a mistake. She watched Kaylin in the dark for a moment. You know about magic. What kind of mistake could you make? All kinds. Like what? Kaylin stared off into the memories. I once delayed for half a second in killing someone. But I thought you said that it was wrong to be too rash. Sometimes the most foolhardy thing you can do is to delay. She was a sorceress. By the time I acted, it was already too late. Because of my mistake, she captured Richard and took him away. For a year, I didn't know what had happened to him. I thought I would never see him again, that I would die of heartache. Jensen stared in astonishment. When did you find him again? Not long ago. That's why we're down here in the old world. She brought him here. At least I found him. I've made other mistakes, and they too have resulted in no end of trouble. So has Richard. Like he said, we all make mistakes. If I can, I want to spare you from making a needless mistake, at least. Jensen looked away. Like believing in that man I was with yesterday, Sebastian. Because of him, my mother was murdered and I almost got you killed. I feel like such a fool. You didn't make that mistake out of carelessness, Jensen. They deceived you, used you. More importantly, in the end, you used your head and were willing to face the truth. Jensen nodded. What should we name the twins, she finally asked. Kaylin didn't think that naming the twins was a good idea, not yet anyway, but she was reluctant to say it. I don't know. What names were you thinking? Jensen let out a heavy breath. It was a shock to suddenly have Betty back with me, and even more of a surprise to see that she had babies of her own. I never considered that before. I haven't even had time to think about names. You will. Jensen smiled at the thought. Her smile grew as if at the thought of something more. You know, she said, I think I understand what Richard meant about thinking of his grandfather as wizardly, even though he never saw him do magic. What do you mean? Well, I can't see magic, so to speak. And Richard didn't do any tonight, at least none I know of. She laughed softly, as pleasing a laugh as Kaylin had ever heard, full of life and joy. It had a quality to it, much like Richard's, the feminine balance to Richard's masculine laugh, two facets of the same delight. And yet, Jensen went on, the things he said made me think of him in that way, wizardly like he said about Zed. When he was saying that, I just knew what he meant, just how he'd felt, because Richard has opened up the world for me. But the gift wasn't the magic he showed me. It was him showing me life, that my life is mine and worth living. Kaylin smiled to herself at how very much that described her own feeling of what Richard had done for her, how he had brought her to cherish life and believe in it not just for others, but most importantly, for herself.
For a time, they sat together, silently watching the empty wasteland. Kalen kept an eye on Richard as he tossed in his sleep. With growing concern, Jensen, too, watched Richard. It looks like there's something wrong with him, she whispered as she leaned close. He's having a nightmare. Kalen watched, as she had so many times before, as Richard made fists in his sleep as he struggled silently against some private terror. It's scary to see him like that, Jensen said. He seems so different. When he's awake, he always seems so reasoned. You can't reason with a nightmare, Kalen said in quiet sorrow. Chapter 6 Richard woke with a start. They were back. He had been having a bad dream. Like all of his dreams, he didn't remember it. He only knew it was a bad dream because it left behind the shapeless feeling of breathless, heart-pounding, undefined, frantic terror. He threw off the lingering pall of the nightmare as he would throw off a tangled blanket. Even though it felt as if the dark things in lingering remnants of the dream were still clawing at him, trying to drag him back into their world, he knew that dreams were immaterial, and so he dismissed it. Now that he was awake, the feeling of dread rapidly began to dissolve, like fog burning off under hot sunlight. Still, he had to make an effort to slow his breathing. What was important was that they were back. He didn't always know when they returned, but this time, for some reason, he was sure of it. Sometime in the night, too, the wind had come up. It buffeted him, pulling at his clothes, tearing at his hair. Out on the sweltering waste, the scorching gusts offered no relief from the heat. Rather than being refreshing, the wind was so hot that it felt as though the door to a blast furnace had opened and the heat were broiling his flesh. Groping for his water skin, he didn't find it immediately at hand. He tried to recall exactly where he'd laid it, but with other thoughts screaming for his attention, he couldn't remember. He would have to worry about a drink later. Kaylin lay close, turned toward him. She had gathered her long hair in a loose fist beneath her chin. The wind whipped stray strands across her cheek. Richard loved just to sit and look at her face. This time, though, he delayed but a moment, looking at her only long enough in the faint starlight to note her even breathing. She was sound asleep. As he scanned their camp, he could just make out a weak blush in the eastern sky. Dawn was still some time off. He realized that he'd slept through his watch. Kara and Kalin had no doubt decided that he needed to sleep more than he was needed for standing a watch and had conspired to not wake him. They were probably right. He had been so exhausted that he'd slept right through the night. Now, though, he was wide awake. His headache, too, was gone. Silently, carefully, Richard slipped away from Kalin so as not to wake her. He instinctively reached for his sword lying at his other side. The metal was warm beneath his touch as his fingers curled around the familiar silver and gold wrought scabbard. It was always reassuring to find the sword at the ready, but even more so at that moment. As he silently rolled to his feet, he slipped the baldric over his head, placing the familiar supple leather across his right shoulder. As he rose up, his sword was already at his hip, ready to do his bidding. Despite how reassuring it was to have the weapon at his side, after the carnage back at the place called the Pillars of Creation, the thought of drawing it sickened him. He recoiled from the mental image of the things he had done. Had he not, though, Kalin wouldn't be sleeping peacefully. She would be dead, or worse. Other good had come of it, too. Jensen had been pulled back from the brink. He saw her curled up beside her beloved goat, her arm corralling Betty's two sleeping kids. He smiled at seeing her, at what a wonder it was to have a sister, smiled at how smart she was and all the wonders of life she had ahead of her. It made him happy that she was eager to be around him, but being around him made him worry for her safety, too. There really wasn't any safe place, though, unless the forces of the order that had been unleashed could be defeated, or at least bottled back up. Page 53. A heavy gust tore through their camp, raising even thicker clouds of dirt. 
Richard blinked, trying to keep the blowing sand out of his eyes. The sound of the wind in his ears was aggravating because it masked other sounds. Though he listened carefully, he could hear only the wind. Squinting against the blowing grit, he saw that Tom was sitting atop his wagon, looking this way and that, keeping watch. Friedrich was asleep on the other side of the horses. Kara, not far away on the desert side of Kalin, putting herself between them and anything that might be out beyond. In the dim starlight, Tom hadn't spotted Richard. When Tom scanned the night in the opposite direction, Richard moved away from camp, leaving Tom to watch over the others. Richard was comfortable in the cloak of darkness. Years of practice had taught him to slip unseen through shadows, to move silently in the darkness. He did that now, moving away from the camp as he focused on what had awakened him, on what others standing watch would not sense. Unlike Tom, the races did not miss Richard's movements. They wheeled high overhead as they watched him, following him as he made his way out along the broken ground. They were almost invisible against the dark sky, but Richard could make them out as they blacked out stars like telltale shadows against the sparkling black curtain of night, shadows that he thought he could feel as well as he could see. That the crushing headache was gone was a great relief, but that it had vanished in the manner that it had was also a cause for concern. The torment often vanished when he was distracted by something important, something dangerous. At the same time, even though the pain was gone, it felt as if it were simply hiding in the shadows of his mind, waiting for him to relax so that it could pounce. When the headaches surged through him, the nauseating pain was so intense that it made him feel sick in every fiber of his being. Even though the crushing pain at times made it difficult for him to stand, to put one foot in front of the other, he had known that to remain behind where they were would have meant certain death. While the headaches were bad in and of themselves, Richard wasn't so much concerned about the pain as he was about the nature of the headaches, their cause. They weren't the same as the headaches he'd had before that he so feared, the headaches brought on by the gift, but they weren't like those he considered to be normal headaches either. Throughout his life, he'd occasionally had terrible headaches, the same as his mother used to have on a more regular basis. She'd called them my grim headaches. Richard thoroughly understood her meaning. These, however grim, were not like those. He worried that they might be caused by the gift. He'd had the headaches brought on by the gift before. He had been told that as he grew older, as his ability grew, as he came to understand more, he would, at times later in his life, be confronted with headaches brought on by the gift. The remedy was supposedly simple. He had only to seek the help of another wizard and have him assist with the necessary next level of awareness and comprehension of the nature of the gift within himself. That mental awareness and understanding would enable him to control and thereby eliminate the pain, to douse the flare-up. At least, that's what he had been told. Of course, in the absence of another wizard to help, the Sisters of the Light would gladly put a collar around his neck to help control the runaway power of the gift. He had been told that such headaches, if not properly tended to, were lethal. This much of it, at least, he knew was true. He couldn't afford to have that problem now, on top of all his others. Right now, there was nothing he could do about it. There was no one anywhere near who could help him with that kind of headache. No wizard, and even though he would never allow it, no sister of the light to put him in a collar again. Richard once more reminded himself that it wasn't the same kind of pain as the last time when it had been brought on by the gift. He reminded himself not to invent trouble he didn't have. He had enough real trouble. He heard the whoosh as one of the huge birds shot past low overhead. The race twisted in flight, lifting on a gust of wind to peer back at him. Another followed in its wake, and then a third, a fourth, and a fifth. They slipped silently away out across the open ground, following one another roughly in a line. Their wings rocked as they worked to stabilize themselves in the gusty air. Some distance away, they soared into a gliding, climbing turn back toward him. 
Before they returned, the races tightened their flight into a circle. When they stroked their huge wings, Richard could usually hear their feathers whisper through the air, although now, with the sound of the wind, he couldn't. Their black eyes watched him watching them. He wanted them to know he was aware of them, that he hadn't slept through their nocturnal return. Were he not so concerned about the meaning of the races, he might think they were beautiful, their sleek black shapes silhouetted majestically against the crimson flush coming to the sky. As he watched, though, Richard couldn't imagine what they were doing. He'd seen this behavior from them before and hadn't understood it then either. He realized suddenly that those other times when they'd returned to circle in this curious fashion, he had also been aware of them. He wasn't always aware of them or aware of when they returned. If he had a headache, though, it had vanished when they returned. The hot wind ruffled Richard's hair as he gazed out across wasteland obscured by the dusty pre-dawn gloom. He didn't like this dead place. Dawn here would offer no promise of a world coming to life. He wished Kalin and he were back in his woods. He couldn't help smiling as he recalled the place in the mountains where the year before they had spent the summer. The place was so wondrous that it had even managed to mellow Kara. In the faint but gathering light, the black-tipped races circled as they always did when they performed this curious maneuver, not over him, but a short distance away, this time out over the open desert where the buffeting wind unfurled diaphanous curtains of sandy grit. The other times it had been over forested hills or open grassland. This time, as he watched the races, he had to squint to keep the blowing sand from getting in his eyes. Abruptly tipping their broad wings, the races tightened their circle as they descended closer to the desert floor. He knew that they would do this for a short while before breaking up their formation to resume their normal flight. They sometimes flew in pairs and performed spectacular aerial stunts, each gracefully matching the other's every move, as ravens sometimes did, but otherwise they never flew in anything like the compact group of their sporadic circling. And then, as the inky shapes wheeled around in a tight vortex, Richard realized that the trailers of blowing sand below them weren't simply snaking and curling aimlessly in the wind, but were flowing over something that wasn't there. The hair along his arms stood stiffly up. Richard blinked, squinting into the wind, trying to see better in the howling storm of blowing sand. Yet more dust and dirt lifted in the blast of a heavy gust. As the twisting eddies raced across the flat ground and passed beneath the races, they swirled around and over something below, making the shape more distinct. It appeared to be the form of a person. The dirt swirled around the empty void, silhouetting it, defining it, revealing what was there, but not. Whenever the wind lifted and carried with it a heavy load, the outline of the shape, bounded by the swirling sand, looked like the outline of a man shrouded in hooded robes. Richard's right hand found the hilt of his sword. There was nothing to the shape save the sand that flowed over the contours of what wasn't there, the way muddy water streaming around a clear glass bottle revealed its covert contour. The form seemed to be standing still, watching him. There were, of course, no eyes in the empty sockets of blowing sand, but Richard could feel them on him. What is it? Jensen asked in a worried whisper as she rushed up beside him. What's the matter? Do you see something? With his left hand, Richard pushed her back out of his way. So urgent was his headlong rush of need that it took concentrated effort to be gentle about it. He was gripping the hilt of his sword so tightly that he could feel the raised letters of the word truth woven in gold wire through the silver. Richard was invoking from within the sword its purpose for being, the very core of its creation. In answer, the might of the sword's power ignited. Beyond the veil of rage, though, in the shadows of his mind, even as the anger of the sword thundered through him, 
Richard dimly perceived an unexpected opposition on the part of the flux of magic to rise to the summons. It was like heading out a door and leaning his weight into the howl of a gale and stumbling forward a step at unexpectedly finding less resistance than anticipated. Before Richard could question the sensation, the wave of wrath flooded through him, saturating him in the cold fury of the storm that was the sword's power. As the races wheeled, their circle began coming closer. This too they had done before, but this time the shape that moved with them was betrayed by the swirl of sand and grit. It appeared that the intangible hooded man was being pulled closer by the black-tipped races. The distinctive ring of steel announced the arrival of the Sword of Truth in the hot dawn air. Jensen squeaked at his sudden movement and jumped back. The races answered with piercing, mocking cries that carried on the howling wind. The unmistakable sound of Richard's sword being drawn brought Kalen and Kara at a dead run. Kara would have leapt protectively ahead, but she knew better than to get in front of him when he had the sword out. A jeal clenched in her fist, she skidded to a halt off to the side, crouched and at the ready, a powerful cat ready to spring. What is it? Kalen asked as she ran up behind him, gaping out at the pattern in the wind. It's the races, came Jensen's worried voice. They've come back. Kalen stared incredulously at her. The races don't look like the worst of it. Sword in hand, Richard watched the thing below the wheeling races. Feeling the sword in his grip, its power sizzling through the very marrow of his bones, he felt a flash of hesitation, of doubt. With no time to waste, he turned back to Tom, just starting away from securing the lead lines to his big draft horses. Richard mimed shooting an arrow. Grasping Richard's meaning, Tom skidded to a halt and spun back to the wagon. Friedrich urgently seized the tethers to the other horses, working to keep them calm, keeping them from spooking. Leaning in the wagon, Tom threw gear aside as he searched for Richard's bow and quiver. Jensen peered from one grim face to another. What do you mean the races aren't the worst of it? Kara pointed with her Aegeal. That, that figure, that man. Frowning in confusion, Jensen looked back and forth between Kara and the blowing sand. What do you see? Richard asked. Jensen threw her hands up in a gesture of frustration. Black-tipped races, five of them. That and the blinding, blowing sand is all. Is there someone out there? Do you see people coming? She didn't see it. Tom pulled the bow and quiver from the wagon and ran for the rest of them. Two of the races, as if noting Tom running in with the bow, lifted a wing and circled wider. They swept around him once before disappearing into the darkness. The other three, though, continued to circle as if bearing the floating form in the blowing sand beneath them. Closer still, the races came, and the form with them. Richard couldn't imagine what it was, but the sense of dread it engendered rivaled any nightmare. The power from the sword surging through him had no such fear or doubt. Then why did he... Storms of magic within, beyond anything storming across the wasteland, spiraled up through him, fighting for release. With grim effort, Richard contained the need, focused it on the task of doing his bidding should he choose to release it. He was the master of the sword, and had at all times to consciously exert that mastery. By the sword's reaction to what the currents of sand revealed, there could be no doubt as to Richard's conviction of the nature of what stood before him. Then what was it he sensed from the sword? From back by the wagon, a horse screamed. A quick glance over his shoulder revealed Friedrich trying to calm them. All three horses reared against the rope he held fast. They came down stamping their hooves and snorting. From the corner of his eye, Richard saw twin streaks of black shoot in out of the darkness, skimming in just above the ground. Betty let out a terrible wail. And then, as quickly as they'd appeared, they were gone, banished into the thick gloom. 
No, Jensen cried out as she ran for the animals. Before them, the unmoving shape watched. Tom reached out, trying to stop Jensen on the way past. She tore away from him. For a moment, Richard worried that Tom might go after her, but then he was again running for Richard. Out of the dark, swirling murk, the two races suddenly appeared. So close, Richard could see the quills running down through their flight feathers spread wide in the wind. Swooping in out of the swirling storm of dust to rejoin the circle, each carried a small, limp, white form in its powerful talons. Tom ran up, holding the bow out in one hand and the quiver in the other. Making his choice, Richard slammed his sword into its scabbard and snatched up the bow. With one smooth motion, he bent the bow and attached the string. He yanked an arrow from the leather quiver Tom held out in his big fist. As Richard turned to the target, he already had the arrow knocked and was drawing back the string. Distantly, it felt good to feel his muscles straining against the weight, straining against the spring of the bow, loading its force for release. It felt good to rely on his strength, his skill, his endless hours of practice, and not have to depend on magic. The still form of the man who wasn't there seemed to watch. Eddies of sand sluiced over the shape, marking the outline. Richard glared at the head of the form beyond the razor-sharp steel tip of the arrow. Like all blades, it felt comfortingly familiar to Richard. With a blade in his hands, he was in his element, and it mattered not if it was stone dust his blade drew or blood. The steel-tipped arrow was squarely centered on the empty spot in the curve of blowing sand that formed the head. The piercing cry of races carried above the howl of the wind. String to his cheek, Richard savored the tension in his muscles, the weight of the bow, the feathers touching his flesh, the distance between blade and objective filled with swirling sand, the pull of the wind against his arm, the bow and the arrow. Each of those factors and a hundred more went into an inner calculation that after a lifetime of practice required no conscious computation, yet decided where the point of the arrow belonged once he called the target. The form before him stood watching. Richard abruptly raised the bow and called the target. The world became not only still but silent for him as the distance seemed to contract. His body was drawn as taut as the bow, the arrow becoming a projection of his fluid-focused intent, the mark before the arrow, his purpose for being. His conscious intent invoked the instant sum of the calculation needed to connect arrow and target. The swirling sand seemed to slow as the race's wings spread wide, dragged through the thick air. There was no doubt in Richard's mind what the arrow would find at the end of a journey only just begun. He felt the string hit his wrist. He saw the feathers clear the bow above his fist. The arrow's shaft flexed slightly as it sprang away and took flight. Richard was already drawing the second arrow from the quiver in Tom's fist as the first found its target. Black feathers exploded in the crimson dawn. The bird tumbled gracelessly through the air and with a hard thud hit the ground not far from the shape floating just above the ground. The bloody white form was free of the talons, but it was too late. The four remaining races screamed in fury. As the birds pumped their wings, clawing for height, one railed at Richard with a shrill scream. Richard called the target. The second arrow was off. The arrow ripped right into the race's open throat and out the back of the head, cutting off the angry cry. The flightless weight plummeted to the ground. The form below the remaining three races began to dissolve in the swirling sand. The three remaining birds, as if abandoning their charge, wheeled around, racing toward Richard with angry intent. He calmly considered them from behind feathers of his own. The third arrow was away. The race in the center lifted its right wing, trying to change direction, but took the arrow through its heart. Rolling wing over wing, it spiraled down through the blowing sand, crashing to the hard pan out ahead of Richard. The remaining two birds, screeching defiant cries, plunged toward him. 
Richard pulled string to cheek, placing the fourth arrow on target. The range was swiftly closing. The arrow was away in an instant. It tore through the body of the black-tipped ray still clutching in its talons the bloody corpse of the tiny kid. Wings raked back, the last angry race dove toward Richard. As soon as Richard snatched an arrow from the quiver and impatient Tom held out, the big Daharan heaved his knife. Before Richard could knock the arrow, the whirling knife ripped into the raptor. Richard stepped aside as the huge bird shot past in a lifeless drop and slammed into the ground right behind him. As it tumbled, blood sprayed across the windswept rock and black-tipped feathers flew everywhere. The dawn, only moments ago filled with the blood-curdling screams of the black-tipped races, was suddenly quiet, but for the low moan of the wind. Black feathers lifted in that wind, floating out across the open expanse beneath a yellow-orange sky. At that moment, the sun broke the horizon, throwing long shadows out over the wasteland. Jensen clutched one of the limp white twins to her breast. Betty, bleating plaintively, blood running from a gash on her side, stood on her hind legs, trying to arouse her still kid in Jensen's arms. Jensen bent to the other twin sprawled on the ground and laid her lifeless charge beside it. Betty urgently licked at the bloody carcasses. Jensen hugged Betty's neck a moment before trying to pull the goat away. Betty dug in her hooves, not wanting to leave her stricken kids. Jensen could do no more than to offer her friend consoling words choked with tears. When she stood, unable to turn Betty from her dead offspring, Richard sheltered Jensen under his arm. Why would the races suddenly do that? I don't know, Richard said. You didn't see anything other than the races then? Jensen leaned against Richard, holding her face in her hands, giving in briefly to the tears. I just saw the birds, she said, as she used the back of her sleeve to wipe her cheeks. What about the shape defined by the blowing sand? Kaylin asked as she placed a comforting hand on Jensen's shoulder. Shape? She looked from Kaylin to Richard. What shape? It looked like a man's shape. Kaylin drew the curves of an outline in the air before her with both hands. Like the outline of a man wearing a hooded cape. I didn't see anything but black-tipped races and the clouds of blowing sand. And you didn't see the sand blowing around anything? Richard asked. You didn't see any shape defined by the sand? Jensen shook her head insistently before returning to Betty's side. If the shape involved magic, Kaylin said in a confidential tone to Richard, she wouldn't see that. But why wouldn't she see the sand? To her, the magic wasn't there. But the sand was. The color is there on a painting, but a blind person can't see it. Nor can they see the shapes that the brush strokes, laden with color, help define. He shook his head in wonder as he watched Jensen. We don't really know to what degree someone is affected by other things when they can't perceive the magic that interacts with those other things. For all we know, it could be that her mind simply fails to recognize the pattern caused by magic and just reads it as blowing sand. It could even be that because there is a pattern to the magic, only we can see those particles of sand directly involved with defining the pattern while she sees them all, and therefore the subordinate pattern is lost to her eyes. It could even be that it's something like the boundaries were, two worlds existing in the same place at the same time. Jensen and we could be looking at the same thing and see it through different eyes, through different worlds. Kalen nodded as Richard bent to one knee beside Jensen to inspect the gash through the goat's wiry brown hair. We'd better stitch this, he told Jensen. It's not life-threatening, but it needs attention. Jensen snuffled back her tears as Richard stood. It was magic then? The thing you saw? Richard stared off toward where the form had appeared in the blowing sand. Something evil. Off behind them, Rusty tossed her head and whinnied in sympathy with inconsolable Betty. When Tom laid a sorrowful hand on Jensen's shoulder, she seized it as if for strength. 
and held it to her cheek. Jensen finally stood, shielding her eyes against the blowing dust as she looked to the horizon. At least we're rid of the filthy races. Not for long, Richard said. His headache came slamming back with such force that it nearly took him from his feet. He had learned a great deal about controlling pain, about how to disregard it. He did that now. There were bigger worries. Chapter 7 Around mid-afternoon, as they were walking across the scorching desert, Kalen noticed Richard carefully watching his shadow stretched out before him. What is it? she asked. What's the matter? He gestured at the shadow before him. Races. Ten or twelve. They just glided up behind us. They're hiding in the sun. Hiding in the sun? They're flying high and in the spot where their shadow falls on us. If we were to look up in the sky, we wouldn't be able to see them, because we'd have to look right into the sun. Kaylin turned, and with her hand shielding her eyes, tried to see for herself, but it was too painful to try to look up anywhere near the merciless sun. When she looked back, Richard, who hadn't turned to look with her, again flicked his hand toward the shadows. If you look carefully at the ground around your shadow, you can just make out the distortion in the light. It's them. Kaylin might have thought that Richard was having a little fun with her, were it not about a matter as serious as the races. She searched the ground around their shadows until she finally saw what he was talking about. At such a distance, the races' shadows were little more than shifting irregularities in the light. Kaylin glanced back at the wagon. Tom was driving, with Friedrich sitting up on the seat beside him. Richard and Kalin were giving the horses a rest from being ridden, so they were tethered to the wagon. Jensen sat on blankets in the back of the wagon, comforting Betty as she bleated in misery. Kalin didn't think the goat had been silent for more than a minute or two all day. The gash wasn't bad. Betty's suffering was from other pain. At least the poor goat had Jensen for solace. From what Kalen had learned, Jensen had had Betty for half her life, moving around as she and her mother had, running from dark and raw, hiding, staying away from people so as not to reveal themselves and risk word drifting back to dark and raw's ears. Jensen had never had a chance to have childhood friends. Her mother had gotten her the goat as a companion. In her constant effort to keep Jensen out of the hands of a monster, it was the best she could offer. Kaylin wiped the stinging sweat from her eyes. She took in the four black feathers Richard had bundled together and strung on his upper right arm. He had taken the feathers when he'd retrieved the arrows that were still good. Richard had given the last feather to Tom for killing the fifth race with his knife. Tom wore his single feather like Richard on his arm. Tom thought of it as a trophy of sorts, awarded by the Lord Rawl. Kalen knew that Richard wore his four feathers for a different reason. It was a warning for all to see. Kalen pulled her hair back over her shoulder. Do you think that was a man below the races? A man watching us? Richard shrugged. You know more about magic than me. You tell me. I've never seen anything like it. She frowned over at him. If it was a man, or something like that, why do you think he finally decided to reveal himself? I don't think he did decide to reveal himself. Richard's intent gray eyes turned toward her. I think it was an accident. How could it be an accident? If it's someone using the races to track us, and he can somehow see us... See us how? I don't know. See us through the eyes of the races. You can't do that with magic. Richard fixed her with a trenchant look. Fine, then what was it? Kalen looked back at the shadows stretching out before them on the buckskin-colored rock, back at the small, bleary shapes moving around the shadow of her head like flies around a corpse. I don't know. You were saying about someone using the races to track us, to see us? I think, Richard said, that someone is watching us through the races or with their aid, or something like that, and they can't really see everything. They can't see clearly. 
So? So, since he can't see with clarity, I think maybe he didn't realize that there was a sandstorm. He didn't anticipate what the blowing sand would reveal. I don't think he intended to give himself away. Richard looked over at her again. I think he made a mistake. I think he showed himself accidentally. Kaylin let out a measured, exasperated breath. She had no argument for such a preposterous notion. It was no wonder he hadn't told her the full extent of his theory. She had been thinking, when he said the races were tracking them, that probably a web had been cast and then some event had triggered it, most likely Kara's innocent touch, and that spell had then attached to them, causing the races to follow that marker of magic. Then, as Jensen had suggested, someone was simply watching where the races were in order to get a pretty good idea of where Richard and Kalin were. Kalin had thought of it in terms of the way Dark and Rahl had once hooked a tracer cloud to Richard in order to know where they were. Richard wasn't thinking in terms of what had happened before. He was looking at it through the prism of a seeker. There were still a number of things about Richard's notion that didn't make sense to her, but she knew better than to discount what he thought simply because she had never heard of such a thing before. Maybe it's not a he, she finally said. Maybe it's a she. Maybe a sister of the dark. Richard gave her another look, but this one was more worry than anything else. Whoever it is, whatever it is, I don't think it can be anything good. Kaylin couldn't argue that much of it, but still she couldn't reconcile such a notion. Well, let's say it's like you think it is, that we spotted him spying on us by accident. Why did the races then attack us? Dust rose from Richard's boot as he casually kicked a small stone. I don't know. Maybe he was just angry that he'd given himself away. He was angry so he had the races kill Betty's kids and attack you? Richard shrugged. I'm just guessing because you asked. I'm not saying I think it's so. The long feathers, blood red at their base, turning to a dark gray and then to inky black at the tip, ruffled in the gusts of wind. As he thought it over, his tone turned more speculative. It could even be that whoever it was using the races to watch us had nothing at all to do with the attack. Maybe the races decided to attack on their own. They simply took the reins from whoever it was that was taking them for the ride? Maybe. Maybe he can send them to us so he can have a peek at where we are, where we're going, but can't control them much more than that. In frustration, Kalen let out a sigh. Richard, she said, unable to hold back her doubts, I know a good deal about all sorts of magic, and I've never heard of anything like this being possible. Richard leaned close, again taking her in with those arresting gray eyes of his. You know about all sorts of things, magic from the Midlands. Maybe down here they have something you never encountered before. After all, had you ever heard of a dream walker before we encountered Jagang? Or even thought such a thing was possible? Kaylin pulled her lower lip through her teeth as she studied his grim expression for a long moment. Richard hadn't grown up around magic. It was all new to him. In some ways, though, that was a strength because he didn't have preconceived notions about what was possible and what wasn't. Sometimes, the things they'd encountered were unprecedented. To Richard, just about all magic was unprecedented. So, what do you think we should do? She finally asked in a confidential tone. What we planned. He glanced over his shoulder to see Kara scouting a goodly distance off to their left side. It has to be connected to the rest of it. Kara only meant to protect us. I know. And who knows, maybe it would have been worse if she hadn't touched it. It could even be that by doing what she did, she actually bought us time. Kaylin swallowed at the feeling of dread churning in her. Do you think we still have enough time? We'll think of something. We don't even know yet for sure what it could mean. When the sand finally runs out of an hourglass, it usually means the goose is cooked. We'll find an answer. Promise? 
Richard reached over and gently caressed the back of her neck. Promise. Kalen loved his smile, the way it sparkled in his eyes. Somewhere in the back of her mind, she knew that he always kept his promises. His eyes held something else, though, and that distracted her from asking if he believed the answer he promised would come in time, or even if it would be an answer that could help them. You have a headache, don't you, she said. Yes. His smile had vanished. It's different than before, but I'm pretty sure it's caused by the same thing. The gift. That's what he meant. What do you mean it's different? And if it's different, then what makes you think the cause is the same? He thought about it a moment. Remember when I was explaining to Jensen about how the gift needs to be balanced? How I have to balance the fighting I do by not eating meat? When she nodded, he went on. It got worse right then. Headaches, even those kind, vary. No, he said, frowning as he tried to find the words. No, it was almost as if talking about, thinking about the need not to eat meat in order to balance the gift somehow brought it more to the fore and made the headaches worse. Kalen didn't at all like that concept. You mean like maybe the gift within you that is the cause of the headaches is trying to impress upon you the importance of balance in what you do with the gift? Richard raked his fingers back through his hair. I don't know. There's more to it. I just can't seem to get it all worked out. Sometimes when I try, when I go down that line of reasoning about how I need to balance the fighting I do, the pain starts to get so bad I can't dwell on it. And something else, he added. There might be a problem with my connection to the magic of the sword. What? How can that be? I don't know. Kalen tried to keep the alarm out of her voice. Are you sure? He shook his head in frustration. No, I'm not sure. It just seemed different when I felt the need of it and drew the sword this morning. It was as if the sword's magic was reluctant to rise to the need. Kalen thought it over a moment. Maybe that means that the headaches are something different this time. Maybe they aren't really caused by the gift. Even if some of it is different, I still think its cause is the gift, he said. One thing they do have in common with the last time is that they're gradually getting worse. What do you want to do? He lifted his arms out to the sides and let them fall back. For now, we don't have much of a choice. We have to do what we planned. We could go to Zed. If it is the gift, as you think, then Zed would know what to do. He could help you. Kalen, do you honestly believe that we have any chance in creation of making it all the way to Aiden Drill in time? Even if it weren't for the rest of it, if the headaches are from the gift, I'd be dead weeks before we could travel all the way to Aiden Drill. And that's not even taking into account how difficult it's bound to be getting past Jagang's army all throughout the Midlands, and especially the troops around Aiden Drill. Maybe he's not there now. Richard kicked at another stone in the path. You think Jagang is just going to leave the wizard's keep and all it contains? Leave it all for us to use against him? Zed was first wizard. For someone of his ability, defending the wizard's keep wouldn't be too difficult. He also had Addy there with him to help. The old sorceress alone could probably defend a place such as the keep. Zed knew what the keep would mean to Jagang, could he gain it. Zed would protect the keep no matter what. There's no way for Jagang to get past the barriers in that place, Kalen said. That much of it was one worry they could set aside. Jagang knows that and might not waste time holding an army there for nothing. You may be right, but that still doesn't do us any good. It's too far. Too far. Kalen seized Richard's arm and dragged him to a halt. The Sliff! If we can find one of her wells, we could travel in the Sliff. If nothing else, we know there's the well down here in the Old World, in Tanamora. Even that's a lot closer than a journey overland all the way to Aden Drill. Richard looked north. That might work. We wouldn't have to make it past Jagang's army. We could come right up inside the keep. 
He put his arm around her shoulders. First, though, we have to see to this other business. Kalen grinned. All right. We take care of me first, then we see to taking care of you. She felt a heady sense of relief that there was a solution at hand. The rest of them couldn't travel in the sliff. They didn't have the required magic. But Richard, Kalen, and Kara certainly could. They could come up right in the keep itself. The keep was immense and thousands of years old. Kalen had spent much of her life there, but she had seen only a fraction of the place. Even Zed hadn't seen it all because of some of the shields that had been placed there ages ago by those with both sides of the gift, and Zed had only the additive side. Rare and dangerous items of magic had been stored there for eons, along with records and countless books. By now, it was possible that Zed and A.D. had found something in the keep that would help drive the Imperial Order back to the old world. Not only would going to the keep be a way to solve Richard's problem with the gift, but it might provide them with something they needed to swing the tide of the war back to their side. Suddenly, seeing Zed, Aidendril, and the keep seemed only a short time away. With a renewed sense of optimism, Kalen squeezed Richard's hand. She knew that he wanted to keep scouting ahead. I'm going to go back and see how Jensen is doing. As Richard moved on and Kalen slowed, letting the wagon catch up with her, another dozen black-tipped races drifted in on the air currents high above the burning plain. They stayed close to the sun and well out of range of Richard's arrows, but they stayed within sight. Tom handed a water skin down to Kaylin when the bouncing wagon rattled up beside her. She was so dry that she gulped the hot water without caring how bad it tasted. As she let the wagon roll past, she put a boot in the iron rung and boosted herself up and over the side. Jensen looked to be happy for the company as Kaylin climbed in. Kaylin returned the smile before sitting beside Richard's sister and the puling Betty. How is she? Kaylin asked gently stroking Betty's floppy ears. Jensen shook her head. I've never seen her like this. It's breaking my heart. It reminds me of how hard it was for me when I lost my mother. It's breaking my heart. As she sat back on her heels, Kaylin squeezed Jensen's hand sympathetically. I know it's hard, but it's easier for an animal to get over something like this than for people to do the same. Don't compare it to you and your mother. Sad as this is, it's different. Betty can have more kids, and she'll forget all about this. You or I never could. Before the words were out, Kaylin felt a sudden stab of pain for the unborn child she had lost. How could she ever get over losing her and Richard's child? Even if she ever had others, she would never be able to forget what was lost at the hands of brutes. She idly turned the small, dark stone on the necklace she wore, wondering if she ever would have a child, wondering if there would ever be a world safe for a child of theirs. Are you all right? Kaylin realized that Jensen was watching her face. Kaylin forced herself to put on a smile. I'm just sad for Betty. Jensen ran a tender hand over the top of Betty's head. Me too but I know that she'll be all right. Kalen watched the endless expanse of ground slowly slide by to either side of the wagon. Waves of heat made the horizon liquid with detached pools of ground floating up into the sky. Still, they saw nothing growing. The land was slowly rising, though, as they came ever closer to distant mountains. She knew that it was only a matter of time until they reached life again, but right then it felt like they never would. I don't understand about something, Jensen said. You told me how I shouldn't do anything rash when it came to magic, unless I was sure of what would happen. You said it was dangerous. You said not to act in matters of magic until you can be sure of the consequence. Kalen knew what Jensen was driving at. That's right. Well, that back there pretty much seemed like one of those stabs in the dark you warned me about. I also told you that sometimes you had no choice but to act immediately. That's what Richard did. I know him. He used his best judgment. 
Jensen looked to be satisfied. I'm not suggesting that he was wrong. I'm just saying that I don't understand. It seemed pretty reckless to me. How am I supposed to know what you mean when you tell me not to do anything reckless if it involves magic? Kalen smiled. Welcome to life with Richard. Half the time I don't know what's in his head. I've often thought he was acting recklessly and it turned out to be the right thing, the only thing he could have done. That's part of the reason he was named Seeker. I'm sure he took into account things he sensed that even I couldn't. But how does he know those things? How can he know what to do? Oftentimes he's just as confused as you or even me. But he's different too, and he's sure when we wouldn't be. Different? Kalen looked over at the young woman, at her red hair shining in the afternoon sunlight. He was born with both sides of the gift. All those born with the gift in the last 3,000 years have been born with additive magic only. Some, like Dark and Rawl and the Sisters of the Dark, have been able to use subtractive magic, but only through the Keeper's help, not on their own. Richard alone has been born with subtractive magic. That's what you mentioned last night, but I don't know anything about magic, so I don't know what that means. We're not exactly sure of everything it means ourselves. Additive magic uses what is there and adds to it, or changes it somehow. The magic of the Sword of Truth, for example, uses anger and adds to it, takes power from it, adds to it until it's something else. With additive, for example, the gifted can heal. Subtractive magic is the undoing of things. It can take things and make them nothing. According to Zed, subtractive magic is the counter to additive, as night is today. Yet it is all part of the same thing. Commanding subtractive, as Dark and Rawl did, is one thing, but to be born with it is quite another. Long ago, unlike now, being born with the gift, both sides of the gift, was common. The Great War then resulted in a barrier sealing the new world off from the old. That's kept the peace all this time, but things have changed since then. After that time, not only have those born with the gift gradually become exceedingly rare, but those who have been born with the gift haven't been born with the subtractive side of it. Richard was born of two lines of wizards, Dark and Rawl and his grandfather Zed. He's also the first in thousands of years to be born with both sides of the gift. All of our abilities contribute to how we're able to react to situations. We don't know how having both sides contributes to Richard's ability to read a situation and do what's necessary. I suspect he may be guided by his gift, perhaps more than he believes. Jensen let out a troubled sigh. After all this time, how did this barrier come to be down anyway? Richard destroyed it. Jensen looked up in astonishment. Then it's true. Sebastian told me that the Lord Rahl, Richard, had brought the barrier down. Sebastian said it was so that Richard could invade and conquer the old world. Kalen smiled at such a grandiose lie. You don't believe that part of it, do you? No, not now. Now that the barrier is down, the Imperial Order is flooding up into the New World, destroying or enslaving everything before them. Where can people live that's safe? Where can we? Until they're stopped or driven back, there is no safe place to live. Jensen thought it over a moment. If the barrier coming down let the Imperial Order flood in to conquer the New World, why would Richard have destroyed it? With one hand, Kalen held on to the side of the wagon as it rocked over a rough patch of ground. She stared ahead, watching Richard walking through the glaring light of the wasteland. Because of me, Kalen said in a quiet voice. One of those mistakes I told you about. She let out a tired sigh. One of those stabs in the dark. Chapter 8 Richard squatted down, resting his forearms across his thighs as he studied the curious patch of rock. His head was pounding with pain. He was doing his best to ignore it. 
The headache had come and gone seemingly without reason. At times, he had begun to think that it just might be the heat after all and not the gift. As he considered the signs on the ground, he forgot about his headache. Something about the rock seemed familiar. Not simply familiar, but unsettlingly familiar. Hooves partially covered by long wisps of wiry brown hair came to an expectant halt beside him. With the top of her head, Betty gently butted his shoulder, hoping for a snack or at least a scratch. Richard looked up at the goat's intent, floppy-eared expression. As Betty watched him watching her, her tail went into a blur of wagging. Richard smiled and scratched behind her ears. Betty bleated her pleasure at the scratch, but it sounded to him like she would have preferred a snack. After not eating for two days as she lay in misery in the wagon, the goat seemed to come back to life and begin to recover from the loss of her two kids. Along with her appetite, Betty's curiosity had returned. She especially enjoyed scouting with Richard when he would let her come along. It made Jensen laugh to watch the goat trotting after him like a puppy. Maybe what really made her laugh was that Betty was getting back to her old self. In recent days, the land had changed, too. They had begun to see the return of life. At first, it had simply been the rusty discoloration of lichen growing on the fragmented rock. Soon after, they spotted a small thorny bush growing in a low place. Now the rugged plants grew at widely spaced intervals dotting the landscape. Betty appreciated the tough bushes, dining on them as if they were the finest salad greens. On occasion, the horses sampled the brush, then turned away, never finding it to their liking. Lichen that had begun to grow on the rock appeared as crusty splotches streaked with color. In some places, it was dark, thick, and leathery, while in other spots, it was no more than what almost appeared to be a coat of thin green paint. The greenish discoloration filled cracks and crevices and coated the underside of stones where the sun didn't bleach it out. Rocks sticking partway out of the crumbly ground could be pulled up to reveal thin tendrils of dark brown subterranean fungal growth. Tiny insects with long feelers skittered from rock to rock or hid in holes in the scattering of rocks lying about on the ground that looked as if they had once been boiling and bubbling and had suddenly turned to stone, leaving the bubbles forever set in place. An occasional glossy green beetle, bearing wide pincer jaws, waddled through the sand. Small red ants stacked steep, ruddy mounds of dirt around their holes. There were cottony webs of spiders in the crotches of the isolated, small, spindly brush, growing sporadically across the ever-rising plain. Slender, light green lizards sat on rocks basking in the sun, watching the people pass. If they came too close, the little creatures, lightning quick, darted for cover. The signs of life Richard had so far seen were still a long way from being anything substantial enough to support people, but it was at least a relief to once again feel like he was rejoining the world of the living. He knew, too, that up beyond the first wall of mountains they would at last encounter life in abundance. He also knew that there they would again begin to encounter people. Birds, as well, were just beginning to become a common sight. Most were small, strawberry-colored finches, ash-colored gnatcatchers, rock wrens, and black-throated sparrows. In the distance, Richard saw single birds winging through the blue sky while sparrows congregated in small, skittish flocks. Here and there, birds lit on the scraggly brush, flitting about looking for seeds and bugs. The birds disappeared instantly whenever the races glided into sight. Staring at the expanse of rock and open ground before him, Richard rose up, startled, as the reason it looked unsettlingly familiar came to him. At the same time as the realization came to him, his headache vanished. Off to his right, Richard saw Kalin with Kara at her side, making their way out to where Richard stood staring down at the astonishing stretch of rock. The wagon, with Tom, Friedrich, and Jensen, rumbled on in the distance to the south. 
the dust raised by the wagon and horses hung in the dead air and could be seen for miles. Richard supposed that with the races periodically paying them a visit, the telltale of the dust didn't much matter. Still, he would be glad when they reached ground where they could at least have a chance to try to remain a little more inconspicuous. Find anything interesting? Kaylin asked as she wiped her sleeve across her forehead. Richard cast a few small pebbles down at the stretch of rock he'd been studying. Tell me what you think of that. I think you look like you feel better, Kaylin said. Her eyes on his, she gave him her special smile, the smile she gave no one but him. He couldn't help grinning. Kara, ignoring the smiles that passed between Richard and Kaylin, leaned in for a gander. I think Lord Rawl has been looking at too many rocks. This is more rock, just like all the rest. Is it? Richard asked. He gestured at the area he'd been scrutinizing and then pointed at another place by where Kaelin and Kara stood. Is it the same as that? Kara peered at both areas briefly before she folded her arms. The rock over there that you've been looking at is just a paler brown, that's all. Kaelin shrugged. I think she's right, Richard. It looks like the same kind of rock, maybe just a little more of a tan color. She thought it over a moment as she scanned the ground, then added to her assessment. I guess it looks more like the rock we've been walking across for days until we started encountering a little bit of grass and brush. Richard put his hands on his hips as he stared back at the remarkable stretch of rock he'd found. Tell me then, what characterized the rock in the place where we were before, a few days ago, back closer to the pillars of creation? Kaelin looked over at an expressionless Kara and then frowned at Richard. Characterized it? Nothing. It was a dead place. Nothing grew there. Richard waved his hand around, indicating the land through which they were now traveling. And this? Now things are growing. Kara said, becoming increasingly disinterested in his study of flora and fauna. Richard held a hand out. And there? Nothing is growing there yet, Kara said in an exasperated sigh. There are a lot of spots around where nothing is growing yet. It's still a wasteland. Just have patience, Lord Rawl, and we will soon enough be back among the fields and forests. Kaelin wasn't paying attention to what Kara was saying. She was frowning as she leaned closer. The place where things begin to grow seems to start all at once, Kaelin said almost to herself. Isn't that curious? I certainly think so, Richard said. I think Lord Rawl needs to drink more water, Kara sniped. Richard smiled. Here, stand over here, he told her. Stand over by me and look again. Kara? Her curiosity aroused, did as he asked. She looked down at the ground and then frowned at the places where things grew. The mother confessor is right. Kara's voice had taken on a decidedly business-like tone. Do you think it's important? Or somehow a danger? Yes, to the first anyway, Richard said. He squatted down beside Kalen. Now, look at this. As Kaelin and Kara knelt down beside him, leaning forward, looking closely at the rock, Richard had to push a curious Betty back out of the way. He then pointed out a patch of yellow streaked lichen. Look here, he said. See this medallion of lichen? It's lopsided. This side is round, but this side, near where nothing grows, is flatter. Kaelin looked up at him. Lichen grows on rocks in all kinds of shapes. Yes, but look at how the rock over where there is lichen and brush growing is spotted all over with little bits of growth. Here, beyond the stunted side of the lichen, there is nearly nothing. The rock almost looks scoured clean. If you look closely, there are a few tiny things, things that have started to grow only in the last couple of years, but they have yet to really begin to take hold. Yes, Kalen said in a cautious drawl, it is odd, but I'm not sure what you're getting at. Look at where things are growing and where they aren't. Well, yes, on that side there's nothing growing, and over here there is. 
Don't just look down. Richard lifted her chin. Look out at the boundary between the two. Look at the whole pattern. Kaylin frowned off into the distance. All of a sudden, the color drained from her face. Dear spirits, she whispered. Richard smiled that she finally saw what he was talking about. What are you two mooning over? Kara complained. Richard put his hand behind Kara's neck and pulled her head in to look at what he and Kaylin were seeing. That's odd, she said, squinting off into the distance. The place where things are growing seems to stop in a comparatively clean line, like someone has made an invisible fence running east. Right, Richard said as he got up, brushing his hands clean. Now, come on. He started walking north. Kalen and Kara scrambled to their feet and followed behind as he marched across the lifeless rock. Betty bleated and trotted after them. Where are we going? Kara asked as she caught up with him. Just come on, Richard told her. For half an hour, they followed his brisk pace as he headed in a straight line to the north, across rocky ground and gravelly patches where nothing at all grew. The day was sweltering, but Richard almost didn't notice the heat, so focused was he on the lifeless expanse they were crossing. He hadn't yet gone to see what lay at the other side, but he was convinced of what they would find once they reached it. The other two were sweating profusely as they chased behind him. Betty bleated occasionally as she brought up the rear. When they finally reached the place he was looking for, the place where lichen and scraggly brush once again began to appear, he brought them to a halt. Betty poked her head between Kalen and Kara for a look. Now look at this, Richard said. See what I mean? Kalen was breathing hard from the brisk walk in the heat. She pulled her water skin off her shoulder and gulped water. She passed the water skin to Richard. He watched Kara study the patch of ground as he drank. The growing things start again over here, Kara said. She absently scratched behind Betty's ears when the goat rubbed the top of her head impatiently against Kara's thigh. They start to appear in the same kind of line as the other side, back there where we were. Right, Richard said, handing Kara the water skin. Now, follow me. Kara threw up her arms. We just came from that way. Come on, Richard called back over his shoulder. He headed south again, back toward the center of the lifeless patch of rock, the small group in tow. Betty bleated her displeasure at the pace of the hot, dusty excursion. If Kalen or Kara shared Betty's opinion, they didn't voice the complaint. When Richard judged they were back somewhere in the middle, he stood with his feet spread, his fists on his hips, and looked east again. From where they stood, they couldn't make out the sides of the lifeless stretch, the places where growth began. Looking to the east, though, the pattern was evident. A clearly defined strip, miles wide, ran off into the distance. Nothing grew within the bounds of the straight strip of lifeless desert, whether going over rock or sandy ground. To either side, the ground with widely spaced brush and lichen growing on the rock was darker. The place where nothing grew was a lighter tan. In the distance, the discrepancy in the color was even more apparent. The lifeless strip ran straight for mile after mile toward the far mountains, gradually becoming but a faint line following the rise of the ground until, finally, in the hazy distance, it could no longer be seen. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? Kalen asked in a low, troubled voice. What? Kara asked. What are you thinking? Richard studied the confused concern on the Mord Sith's face. What kept Darken Rawl's armies in Dahara? What prevented him for so many years from invading the Midlands and taking it, even though he wanted it? He couldn't cross the boundary, Kara said, as if he must be having heat stroke. And what made up the boundary? At last, Kara's face, framed by the black desert garb, went white, too. The boundary was the underworld? Richard nodded. It was like a rip in the veil, where the underworld existed in this world. Zed told us about it. He put the boundary up with a spell he found in the keep, a spell from those ancient times of the Great War. Once up, the boundary was a place in this world 
where the world of the dead also existed. In that place where both worlds touched, nothing could grow. But are you so sure things wouldn't still grow there? Kara asked. It was still our world after all, the world of life. It would be impossible for anything to grow there. The world of life was there in that spot. The ground was there, but life couldn't exist there on that ground because it shared that same space with the world of the dead. Anything there would be touched by death. Kara looked out at the straight, lifeless strip running off into the wavering distance. So you think what? This is a boundary? Was. Kara looked from his face to Kalin and again out to the distance. Dividing what? Overhead, a flight of black-tipped races came into sight, riding the high currents, turning lazy circles as they watched. I don't know, Richard admitted. He looked west again, back down the gradual slope, running away from the mountains, back to where they had been. But look, Richard said, gesturing out into the burning wasteland from where they had come. It runs back toward the pillars of creation. As the things growing thinned and eventually ceased to be back that way, so too did the lifeless strip. It became indistinguishable from the surrounding wasteland because there was no life to mark where the line had been. There's no telling how far it runs. For all I know, Richard said, it's possible that it runs all the way back to the valley itself. That part makes no sense to me, Kalin said. I can see what you mean about it maybe being like the boundaries up in the New World, the boundaries between Westland, the Midlands, and Ahara. That much I follow. But the spirits take me, I don't get why it would run to the pillars of creation. That part just strikes me as more than odd. Richard turned and gazed back to the east where they were headed, to the rumpled gray wall of mountains rising steeply up from the broad desert floor, studying the distant notch that sat a little north of where the boundary line ran toward those mountains. He looked south to the wagon making its way toward those mountains. We better catch up with the others, Richard finally said. I need to get back to translating the book. Chapter 9 The spectral spires around Richard glowed under the lingering caress of the low sun. In the amber light, as he scouted the forsaken brink of the towering mountains beyond, long pools of shadow were darkening to the blue-black color of bruises. The pinnacles of reddish rock stood like stony guardians along the lower reaches of the desolate foothills, as if listening for the echoing crunch of his footsteps along the meandering gravel beds. Richard had felt like being alone to think, so he had set out to scout by himself, it was hard to think when people were constantly asking questions. He was frustrated that the book hadn't yet told him anything that would in any way help explain the presence of the strange boundary line, much less the connection of the book's title, the place called The Pillars of Creation, and those ungifted people like Jensen. The book, in the beginning that he'd so far translated anyway, appeared mostly to be an historical record dealing with unanticipated matters involving occurrences of pillars of creation, as those like Jensen were called, and the unsuccessful attempts at curing those unfortunates. Richard was beginning to get the clear sense that the book was laying a careful foundation of early details in preparation for something calamitous the nearly quaking care of the recounting of every possible course of action that had been investigated gave him the feeling that whoever wrote the book was being painstaking for reasons of consequence. Not daring to slow their pace, Richard had been translating while riding in the wagon. The dialect was slightly different from the high Daharan he was used to reading, so working out the translation was slow going, especially sitting in the back of the bouncing wagon. He had no way of knowing if the book would eventually offer any answers, but he felt a gnawing worry over what the unfolding account was working up to. He would have jumped ahead, but he'd learned in the past that doing so often wasted more time than it saved, since it interfered with accurately grasping the whole picture, which sometimes led to dangerously erroneous conclusions. He would just have to keep at it. 
After working all day, focused intently on the book, he'd ended up with a fierce headache. He'd had days without them, but now when they came, it seemed they were worse each time. He didn't tell Kalin how concerned he was that he wouldn't make it to the Sliff's well in Tanamura. Besides working at translating, he racked his brain trying to find a solution. While he had no idea what the key to the headaches brought on by the gift was, he had the nagging feeling that it was within himself. He feared it was a matter of balance he was failing to see. He had even resorted when out alone once to sitting and meditating as the sisters had once taught him in order to try to focus on the gift within. It had been to no avail. It would be dark soon, and they would need to stop for the night. Since the terrain had changed, it was no longer a simple task to see if the area all around them was clear. Now there were places where an army could lie in wait. With the races shadowing them, there was no telling who might know where to find them. Besides simply wanting a break to think about what he'd read and what he might find within himself to answer the problem of his headaches, Richard wanted to check the surrounding area himself. Richard paused for a moment to watch a family of quail, the juveniles fully grown, hurry across an open patch of ground. They trotted across the exposed gravel in a line while the father, perched atop a rock, stood lookout. As soon as they melted into the brush, they were again invisible. Small, scraggly pine trees dotted the sweep of irregular hills, gullies, and rocky outcroppings at the fringe of the mountains. Up higher, on the nearby slopes, larger conifers grew in greater abundance. In low, sheltered places, clumps of brush lay in thick clusters. Thin grasses covered some of the open ground. Richard wiped sweat from his eyes. He hoped that with the sun going down, the air might cool a little. As he made his way along the concealment of the base of a runoff channel in a fold of two hills, he reached for the strap of his water skin, about to take a long drink, when movement on a far hillside caught his attention. He slipped behind the screen of a long shelf of rock to stay out of sight. Taking a careful peek, he saw a man making his way down the loose scree on the side of the hill. The sound of the rock crunching underfoot and sliding down the slope sent a distant echo through the rocky canyons. Richard had expected that as they left the forbidding wasteland, they might at any time begin encountering people, so he had had everyone change out of the black outfits of the nomadic desert people and back into their unassuming traveling clothes. While he was in black trousers and simple shirt, his sword was hardly inconspicuous. Kalin as well had put on simple clothes that were more in keeping with the impoverished people of the old world, but on Kalin they didn't seem to make much difference. It was hard to hide her figure and her hair, but most of all her presence. Once those green eyes of hers fixed on people, they usually had an urge to drop to a knee and bow their head. Her clothes made little difference. No doubt Emperor Jagang had spread their description far and wide, and had offered a reward large enough that even his enemies would find it hard to resist. For many in the old world, though, the price of continued life under the brutal rule of the imperial order was too high. Despite the reward, there were many who hungered to live free and were willing to act to gain that goal. There was also the problem of the bond the Lord Rawl had with the Daharan people. Through that ancient bond forged by Richard's ancestors, the Harans could sense where the Lord Rawl was. The Imperial Order could discover where Richard was by that bond, too. All they had to do was torture the information out of a Daharan. If one person failed to talk under torture, they would not be shy about trying others until they learned what they wanted. As Richard watched, the lone man, once he reached the bottom of the hill, made his way along the gravel beds lining the bottom of the rocky gullies. Off to Richard's right, the wagon and horses were lifting a long trail of dust. That was where the man seemed to be headed. At such a distance, it was hard to tell for sure, but Richard doubted that the man was a soldier. He wouldn't likely be a scout, not in his own homeland, and they weren't near the hotbeds of the revolt against the rule of the Imperial Order. Richard didn't think there would be any reason for soldiers to be going this way, 
through such uninhabited areas. That was, after all, why he had picked this route, heading east to the shadow of the mountains before turning to a more northerly route back to where they had been. There was also the possibility that the bond had inadvertently revealed Richard's whereabouts and an army was out looking for him. If the man was a soldier, there could shortly be many more, like ants swarming down out of the hills. Richard climbed the backside of a short rocky prominence and lay on his stomach, watching over the top. As the man got closer, Richard could see that he looked young, under 30 years, a bit scrawny, and was dressed nothing at all like a soldier. By the way he stumbled, he was not used to the terrain, or maybe just not used to traveling. It was tiring walking over ground of loose, sharp, broken rock, especially if it was on a slope, since it never provided any solid place for a steady stride. The man stopped, stretching his neck to peer at the wagon. Panting from the effort of making it down the slope, he combed his fine blonde hair back repeatedly with his fingers, then bent at the waist and rested a hand on a knee while he caught his breath. When the man straightened and started out once more, crunching through the gravel at the bottom of the wash, Richard slid back down the rock. He used the intervening lay of the land and patches of scraggly pine to screen himself from sight. He paused from time to time as he moved closer to listen for the heavy footsteps and labored breathing, checking his dead reckoning estimation of where the man would be. From behind a freestanding wall of rock a good 60 feet tall, Richard carefully peered out for a look. He had managed to close most of the distance without the man being aware of his presence. Richard moved silently from tree to rock to the backside of slopes until he was out ahead of the man and in his line of travel. Still as stone behind a twisted reddish spire of rock jutting from the broken ground, Richard listened to the crunch of footfalls approaching, listened to the man gulping for breath as he climbed over fingers of rock that lay in his way. When the man was not six feet away, Richard stepped out right in front of him. The man gasped, clutching his light travel coat beneath his chin as he cringed back a step. Richard regarded the man without outward emotion, but inside the sword's power churned with the menace of rage restrained. For an instant, Richard felt the power falter. The magic of the sword keyed off its master's perception of danger, so such hesitation could be because the smaller man didn't appear to be an immediate threat. The man's clothes, brown trousers, flaxen shirt, and a light frayed fustian coat had seen better days. He looked to have had a rough time of his journey, but then Richard, too, had put on unassuming clothes in order not to raise suspicion. The man's backpack looked to hold precious little. Two water skins, their straps crisscrossed across his chest, bunching the light coat, were flat and empty. He carried no weapons that Richard saw, not even a knife. The man waited expectantly, as if he feared to be the first to speak. You appear to be headed for my friends, Richard said, tipping his head toward the thin golden plume of dust hanging like a beacon in the sunlight above the darkening plain, giving the man a chance to explain himself. The man, wide-eyed, shoulders hunched, raked back his hair several times. Richard stood before him like a stone pillar, blocking his way. The man's blue eyes turned to each side, apparently checking to see if he had an escape route should he decide to bolt. I mean you no harm, Richard said. I just want to know what you're up to. Up to? Why you're headed for the wagon. The man glanced toward the wagon, not visible beyond the craggy folds of rock, then down at Richard's sword, and finally up into his eyes. I'm looking for help, he finally said. Help? The man nodded. Yes, I'm searching for the one whose craft is fighting. Richard cocked his head. You're looking for a soldier of some kind? He swallowed at the frown on Richard's face. Yes, that's right. Richard shrugged. The Imperial Order has lots of soldiers. I'm sure that if you keep looking, you will come across some. The man shook his head. No, I seek the man from far away 
from far to the north, the man who came to bring freedom to many of the oppressed people of the old world, the man who gives us all hope that the imperial order, may the creator forgive their misguided ways, will be cast out of our lives so that we can be at peace once again. Sorry, Richard said. I don't know anyone like that. The man didn't look disappointed by Richard's words. He looked more like he simply didn't believe them. His fine features were pleasant looking, even though he appeared unconvinced. Do you think you could... The man hesitantly lifted an arm out, pointing. At least let me have a drink? Richard relaxed a bit. Sure. He pulled the strap off his shoulder and tossed his water skin to the man. He caught it as if it were precious glass he feared to drop. He pried at the stopper, finally getting it free, and started gulping the water. He stopped abruptly, lowering the water skin. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to start drinking all of your water right down. It's all right, Richard gestured for him to drink up. I have more back at the wagon. You look to need it. As Richard hooked a thumb behind his wide leather belt, the man bowed his head in thanks before tipping the water skin up for a long drink. Where did you hear about this man who fights for freedom? Richard asked. The man brought the water skin down again, his eyes never leaving Richard as he paused to catch his breath. From many a tongue, the freedom he has spread down here in the old world has brought hope to us all. Richard smiled inwardly at how the bright hope of freedom burned even in a dark place like the heart of the old world. There were people everywhere who hungered for the same things in life, for a chance to live their life free and by their own labor to better themselves. Overhead a black-tipped race, wings spread wide, popped into sight as it glided across the open swath of sky above the rise of rock to each side. Richard didn't have his bow, but the race stayed out of range anyway. The man shrank at seeing the race the way a rabbit would shrink when it saw a hawk. Sorry I can't help you, Richard said when the race had disappeared. He checked behind in the direction of the wagon out beyond the nearby hill. I'm traveling with my wife and family, looking for work, for a place to mind our own business. Richard's business was the revolution, if he was to have a chance for his plan to work, and there were a number of people waiting on him in that regard. He had more urgent problems first, though. But Lord Rall, my people need... Richard spun back around. Why would you call me that? I'm... I'm sorry, the man swallowed. I didn't mean to anger you. What makes you think I'm this Lord Rall? The man painted his hand up and down in front of Richard as he sputtered, trying to find words. You, you, you just are. I can't imagine what else you want me to say. I'm sorry if I have offended you by being so forward, Lord Rall. Kara stalked out from behind a rocky spire. What have we here? The man gasped in surprise at seeing her as he flinched back yet another step, clutching the water skin to his chest as if it were a shield of steel. Tom, his silver knife to hand, stepped up out of a gully behind the man, blocking the way should the man decide to run back the way he'd come. The man turned in a circle to see Tom towering behind. As he finally came back around and saw Kalen standing beside Richard, he let out another gasp. They were all wearing dusty traveling clothes, but somehow Richard didn't suppose that at that moment they looked at all like simple travelers in search of work. Please, the man said, I don't mean any harm. Take it easy, Richard said as he stole a sidelong glance at Kara. His words meant not only for the man, but the Mord Sith as well. Are you alone? Richard asked him. Yes, Lord Rall. I'm on a mission for my people, just as I told you. You are, of course, to be forgiven your aggressive nature. I would expect nothing less. I want you to know I hold no feelings of resentment toward you. Why does he think you're the Lord Rall? Kara said to Richard in a tone that sounded more accusation than question. I've heard the descriptions, the man put in. Still clutching the water skin to his chest, he pointed with the other hand. And that sword? I've heard about Lord Rall's sword. His gaze moved cautiously to Kalen. And the Mother Confessor, of course, he added, dipping his head. 
Of course, Richard sighed. He'd expected that he would have to hide the sword around strangers, but now he knew just how important that was going to be whenever they went into any populated areas. The sword would be relatively easy to hide. Not so with Kalen. He thought that maybe they could cover her in rags and say she was a leper. Page 91. The man leaned cautiously out, arm extended, and handed Richard his water skin. Thank you, Lord Rall. Richard took a long drink of the terrible tasting water before offering it to Kaylin. She lifted hers out for him to see as she declined with a single shake of her head. Richard took another long swig before replacing the stopper and slinging the strap back over his shoulder. What's your name, he asked. Owen. Well, Owen, why don't you come back to camp with us for the night? We can fill up your water skins for you, at least, before you're on your way in the morning. Kara was near to bursting as she gritted her teeth at Richard. Why don't you just let me see too? I think Owen has problems we can all understand. He's concerned for his friends and family. In the morning, he can be on his way, and we can be on ours. Richard didn't want the man out there somewhere in the dark where they couldn't as easily keep an eye on him as they could if he were in camp. In the morning, it would be easy enough to make sure that he wasn't following them. Kara finally understood Richard's intent and relaxed. He knew she would want any stranger in her sight while Richard and Kalen were sleeping. Kalen at his side, Richard started back to the wagon. The man followed, his head swiveling side to side from Tom to Kara and back again. Since they were headed back to the wagon, Richard finished what water remained in his water skin, while behind, Owen thanked him for the invitation and promised not to be any trouble. Richard intended to see to it that Owen kept his promise. Chapter 10 Up in the wagon, Richard dunked Owen's two water skins in the barrel that still had water. Owen, sitting with his back pressed against a wheel, glanced up at Richard from time to time, watching expectantly as Kara glared at him. Kara clearly didn't like the fellow, but as protective as Mord Sith were, that didn't necessarily mean that it was warranted. For some reason, though, Richard didn't care for the man either. It wasn't so much that he disliked him, just that he couldn't warm to the fellow. He was polite and certainly didn't look threatening, but there was something about the man's attitude that made Richard feel edgy. Tom and Friedrich broke up dried wood they'd collected, feeding it into the small fire. The wonderful aroma of pine pitch covered the smell of the nearby horses. From time to time, Owen cast a fearful eye at Kara, Kalen, Tom, and Friedrich. By far, though, he seemed most uneasy about Jensen. He tried to avert his eyes from her, tried not to look her directly in the eye, but his gaze kept being drawn to her red hair shining in the firelight. When Betty approached to investigate the stranger, Owen stopped breathing. Richard told Owen that the goat just wanted attention. Owen gingerly patted the top of Betty's head as if the goat were a gar that might take off his arm if he weren't careful. Jensen, with a smile and ignoring the way he stared at her hair, offered Owen some of her dried meat. Owen just stared wide-eyed up at her leaning down over him. I'm not a witch, she said to Owen. People think my red hair is a sign that I'm a witch. I'm not. I can assure you I have no magic. The edge in her voice surprised Richard, reminding him that there was iron under the feminine grace. Still wide-eyed, Owen said, Of course not. I, I just never saw such beautiful hair before, that's all. Why, thank you, Jensen said, her smile returning. She again offered him a piece of dried meat. I'm sorry, Owen said in polite apology, but I prefer not to eat meat if it's all right with you. He quickly reached in his pocket, bringing out a cloth pouch holding dried biscuit. He forced a smile at Jensen as he held out the biscuits. Would you like one of mine? Tom started, glaring at Owen. Thanks, no, Jensen said, as she withdrew her extended hand and sat down on a low, flat rock. She snagged Betty by an ear and made her lie down at her feet. 
You'd best eat the biscuits yourself if you don't want meat, she said to Owen. I'm afraid we don't have a lot that isn't. Why don't you eat meat, Richard asked. Owen looked up over his shoulder at Richard in the wagon above him. I don't like the thought of harming animals just to satisfy my want of food. Jensen smiled politely. That's a kind-hearted sentiment. Owen twitched a smile before his gaze was drawn once again to her hair. It's just the way I feel, he said, finally looking away from her. Dark and Rall felt the same way, Kara said, turning the glare on Jensen. I saw him horsewhip a woman to death because he caught her eating a sausage in the halls of the people's palace. It struck him as disrespectful of his feelings. Jensen stared in astonishment. Another time, Kara went on as she chewed a bite of sausage, I was with him when he came around the corner outside near the gardens. He spotted a cavalryman atop his horse eating a meat pie. Dark and Rawl lashed out with a flash of conjured lightning, beheading the man's horse in an instant. Thump! It dropped into the hedge. The man managed to land on his feet as the rest of his horse crashed to the ground. Dark and Rawl reached out, drew the man's sword, and in a fit of anger slashed the belly of the horse open. Then he seized the soldier by the scruff of his neck and shoved his face into the horse's innards, screaming at him to eat. The man tried his best, but ended up suffocated in the horse's worn viscera. Owen covered his mouth as he closed his eyes. Kara waved her sausage, as if indicating Dark and Rawl standing before her. He turned to me, the fire gone out of him, and asked me how people could be so cruel as to eat meat. Jensen, her mouth hanging open, asked, What did you say? Kara shrugged. What could I say? I told him I didn't know. But why would people eat meat then if he was like that? Jensen asked. Most of the time he wasn't. Vendors sold meat at the palace and he usually paid it no mind. Sometimes he would shake his head in disgust or call them cruel, but usually he didn't even take notice of it. Friedrich was nodding. That was the thing about the man. You never know what he was going to do. He might smile at the person or have them tortured to death. You never knew. Kara stared into the low flames of the fire before her. There was no way to reason out how he would react to anything. Her voice took on a quiet, haunted quality. A lot of people simply decided that it was only a matter of time until he killed them too, and so they lived their lives as the condemned would waiting for the axe to fall, taking no pleasure in life or the thought of their future. Tom nodded his grim agreement with Kara's assessment of life in Dahara as he fed a crook of driftwood into the fire. Is that what you did, Kara? Jensen asked. Kara looked up and scowled. I am Mord Sith. Mord Sith are always ready to embrace death. We do not wish to die old and toothless. Owen, nibbling his dried biscuit as if out of obligation to eat since the rest of them were, was clearly shaken by the story. I can't imagine life with such savagery as all of you must live. Was this dark and raw related to you, Lord Rawl? Owen suddenly seemed to think he might have made a mistake and rushed to amend his question. He has the same name, so I thought, well, I just thought, but I didn't mean to imply that I thought you were like him. Stepping down from the wagon, Richard handed Owen his full water skins. He was my father. I didn't mean anything by the question. I would never intentionally cast dispersions on a man's father, especially a man who... I killed him, Richard said. Richard didn't feel like elaborating. He recoiled from the very thought of going into the whole dreadful tale. Owen gaped around as if he were a fawn surrounded by wolves. He was a monster... Kara said, appearing to feel the need to rise to Richard's defense. Now the people of Dahara have a chance to look forward to a future of living their lives as they wish. Richard sat down beside Kalin. At least they will if they can be free of the Imperial Order. Head down, Owen nibbled on his biscuit as he watched the others. When no one else spoke, Kalin did. 
Why don't you tell us your reasons for coming here, Owen? Richard recognized her tone as that of the mother confessor asking a polite question meant to put a frightened petitioner at ease. He dipped his head respectfully. Yes, mother confessor. You know her, too? Richard asked. Owen nodded. Yes, Lord Rall. How? The man's gaze shifted from Richard to Kalin and back again. Word of you and the mother confessor has spread everywhere. Word of the way you freed the people of all Turang from the oppression of the imperial order is known far and wide. Those who want freedom know that you are the one who gives it. Richard frowned. What do you mean, I'm the one who gives it? Well, before, the imperial order ruled. They are brutal, forgive me, they are misguided and don't know any better. That is why their rule is so brutal. Perhaps it isn't their fault. It is not for me to say. Owen looked away as he tried to come up with words while apparently seeing his own visions of what the Imperial Order had done to convince him of their brutality. Then you came and gave people freedom, just as you did in all Turang. Richard wiped a hand across his face. He needed to translate the book. He needed to find out what was behind the thing Kara had touched and the black-tipped races following them. He needed to get back to Victor and those who were engaged in the revolt against the Order. He was past due to meet Nietzsche, and he needed to deal with his headaches. At least maybe Nietzsche could help him with that much of it. Owen, oh, I don't give people freedom. Yes, Lord Rall. Owen evidently took Richard's words as something he dared not argue with, but his eyes clearly said that he didn't believe it. Owen, what do you mean when you say that you think I give people freedom? Owen took a tiny bite of his biscuit as he glanced around at the others. He squirmed his shoulders in a self-conscious shrug. Finally, he cleared his throat. Well, you, you do what the Imperial Order does. You kill people. He waved his biscuit awkwardly, as if it were a sword stabbing the air. You kill those who enslave people, and then you give the people who are enslaved their freedom so that peace can return. Richard took a deep breath. He wasn't sure if Owen meant it the way it came out, or if it was just that he was having difficulty explaining himself in front of people who made him nervous. That's not exactly the way it is, Richard said. But that's why you came down here. Everyone knows it. You came down here to the old world to give people freedom. Elbows on his knees, Richard leaned forward, rubbing his palms together as he thought about how much he wanted to explain. He felt a wave of calmness when Kalin draped a gentle, comforting hand over the back of his shoulder. He didn't want to go into the horror of how he had been taken prisoner and taken from Kalin, thinking he would never see her again. Richard put the whole weight of emotion over that long ordeal aside and took another approach. Owen, I'm from up in the New World. Yes, I know, Owen said as he nodded. And you came here to free people from... No, that's not the truth of it. We lived in the New World. We were once at peace, apparently much like your people were. Emperor Jagang, the Dreamwalker... Yes, Emperor Jagang, the Dreamwalker sent his armies to conquer the new world, to enslave our people. My people, too, Richard nodded. I understand. I know what a horror that is. His soldiers are rampaging up through the new world, murdering, enslaving our people. Owen turned his watery gaze off into the darkness as he nodded. My people, too. We tried to fight back, Kalin told him, but there are too many. Their army is far too vast for us to drive them out of our land. Owen nibbled his biscuit again, not meaning her gaze. My people are terrified of the men of the Order. May the Creator forgive their misguided ways. May they scream in agony for all eternity in the darkest shadow of the Keeper of the Underworld, Kara said in merciless correction. Owen stared slack-jawed at such a curse spoken aloud. We couldn't fight them like that, simply drive them back to the old world, Richard said, bringing Owen's gaze back to him as he went on with the story. So I'm down here in Jagang's homeland, helping people who hunger to be free to cast off the shackles of the order. 
While he's away conquering our land, he has left his own homeland open to those who hunger for freedom. With Jagang and his armies away, that gives us a chance to strike at Jagang's soft underbelly to do him meaningful harm. I'm doing this because it's the only way we can fight back against the Imperial Order, our only means to succeed. If I weaken his foundation, his source of men and support, then he will have to withdraw his army from our land and return south to defend his own. Tyranny cannot endure forever. By its very nature, it rots everything it rules, including itself. But that can take lifetimes. I'm trying to accelerate that process so that I and those I love can be free in our lifetimes, free to live our own lives. If enough people rise up against the Imperial Order's rule, it may even loosen Jagang's grip on power and bring him and the Order down. That's how I'm fighting him, how I'm trying to defeat him, how I'm trying to get him out of my land. Owen nodded. This is what we need, too. We are victims of fate. We need for you to come and get his men out of our land and then to withdraw your sword, your ways, from our people so we may live in tranquility again. We need you to give us freedom. The driftwood popped, sending a glowing swirl of sparks skyward. Richard, hanging his head, tapped his fingertips together. He didn't think the man had heard a word he'd said. They needed rest. He needed to translate the book. They needed to get to where they were going. At least he didn't have a headache. Owen, I'm sorry, he finally said in a quiet voice. I can't help you in so direct a manner. But I would like you to understand that my cause is to your advantage too, and that what I'm doing will also cause Jagang to eventually pull his troops out of your homeland as well, or at least weaken their presence, so that you can throw them out yourselves. No, Owen said. His men will not leave my land until you come and... Owen winced. And destroy them. The very word, the implication, looked sickening to the man. Tomorrow, Richard said, no longer bothering to try to sound polite, we have to be on our way. You will have to be on your way as well. I wish you success in ridding your people of the Imperial Order. We cannot do such a thing, Owen protested. He sat up straighter. We are not savages. You and those like you, the unenlightened ones, it is up to you to do it and give us freedom. I am the only one who can bring you. You must come and do as your kind does. You must give our empire freedom. Richard rubbed his fingertips across the furrows of his brow. Kara started to rise. A look from Richard sat her back down. I gave you water, Richard said as he stood. I can't give you freedom. But you must. Double watch tonight, Richard said as he turned to Kara, cutting Owen off. Kara nodded once as her mouth twisted with a satisfied smile of iron determination. In the morning, Richard added, Owen will be on his way. Yes, she said, her blue-eyed glare sliding to Owen. He certainly will be. Chapter 11 What is it? Kaylin asked as she rode up beside the wagon. Richard looked to be furious about something. She saw then that he had the book in one hand, his other was a fist. He opened his mouth about to speak, but when Jensen, up on the seat beside Tom, turned back to see what was going on, Richard said to her instead, Kalen and I are going to check the road up ahead. Keep your eye on Betty so she doesn't jump out, will you, Jen? Jensen smiled at him and nodded. If Betty gives you any trouble, Tom said, just let me know and I'll take her to a lady I know and have some goat sausages made up. Jensen grinned at their private joke and gave Tom a good-natured elbow in his ribs. As Richard climbed over the side of the wagon and dropped to the ground, she snapped her fingers at the tail-wagging goat. Betty, you just stay there. Richard doesn't need you tagging along every single time. Betty, front hooves on the chafing rail, bleated as she looked up at Jensen as if asking for her to reconsider. Down, Jensen said in admonishment. Lie down. Betty bleated, 
and reluctantly hopped back down into the wagon bed. But she would settle for no less than a scratch behind the ears as consolation before she would lie down. Kaylin leaned over from her seat in the saddle and untied the reins to Richard's horse from the back of the wagon. He stepped into the stirrup and gracefully swung up in one fluid motion. She could see that he was agitated about something, but it made her heart sing just to look at him. He shifted his weight forward slightly, urging his horse ahead. Kaylin squeezed her legs to the side of her own horse to spur her into a canter to keep up with Richard. He rode out ahead, rounding several turns in the flatter land among the rough hillsides until he caught up with Kara and Friedrich patrolling out in the lead. We're going to check out front for a while, he told them. Why don't you fall back and check behind? Kalen knew that Richard was sending them to the back because if he took Kalen to the back under the pretense of watching anything that might come up on them from behind, Kara would keep falling back to check on them. If they were out front, Kara wouldn't worry about them dropping back and getting lost. Kara laid her reins over and turned back. Sweat stuck Kalen's shirt to her back as she leaned over her horse's withers, urging her ahead as Richard's horse sprang away. Despite the clumps of tall grass dotting the foothills and occasional sparse patches of woods, the heat was still with them. It cooled some at night now, but the days were hot, with the humidity increasing as the clouds built up against the wall of mountains to their right. Up close, the barrier of rugged mountains to the east was an intimidating sight. Sheer rock walls rose up below projecting plateaus heaped to their very edge with loose rock crumbled from yet higher plateaus and walls as if the entire range was all gradually crumbling. With drops of thousands of feet at the fringe of overhanging shelves of rock, climbing such unstable scree would be impossible. If there were passes through the arid slopes, they were no doubt few and would prove difficult. But making it past those gray mountains of scorching rock they could now see was hardly the biggest problem. Those closer mountains spreading north and south in the burning heat at the edge of the desert partially hid what lay to the other side. A far more daunting range of snow-capped peaks rising up to completely block any passage east. Those imposing mountains were beyond the scale of any Kalin had ever seen. Not even the most rugged of the Rang Shada mountains in the Midlands were their match. These mountains were like a race of giants. Precipitous walls of rock soared thousands of feet straight up. Harrowing slopes rose unbroken by any pass or rift and were so arduous that few trees could find a foothold. Lofty snow-packed peaks that ascended majestically above wind-swept clouds were jammed so close together that it reminded her more of a knife's long jagged edge than separate summits. The day before, when Kalen had seen Richard studying those imposing mountains, she had asked him if he thought there was any way across them. He had said no that the only way he could see to get beyond was possibly the notch he'd spotted before when he had found the place where the strange boundary had once been, and that notch still lay some distance north. For now, they skirted the dry side of the closer mountains as that range made its way north along the more easily traversed lowlands. Along the base of a gentle hill covered in clumps of brown grasses, Richard finally slowed his horse. He turned in his saddle, checking that the others were still coming, if a goodly distance behind. He pulled his horse close beside her. I skipped ahead in the book. Kalen didn't like the sound of that. When I asked you before why you didn't skip ahead, you said that it wasn't a wise thing to do. I know, but I wasn't really getting anywhere, and we need answers. As their horses settled into a comfortable walk, Richard rubbed his shoulders. After all that heat, I can't believe how cold it's getting. Cold? What are you... You know those rare people like Jensen? The leather of his saddle squeaked as he leaned toward her. Ones born pristinely ungifted, without even that tiny spark of the gift, the pillars of creation? Well, back when this book was written, they weren't so rare. You mean it was more common for them to be born? 
No, the ones who had been born began to grow up, get married, and have children. Ungifted children. Kalen looked over in surprise. The broken links in the chain of the gift that you were talking about before? Richard nodded. They were children of the Lord Rall. Back then, it wasn't like it has been in recent times with Darken Rall or his father. From what I can tell, all the children of the Lord Rall and his wife were part of his family and treated as such, even though they were born with this problem. It seems that the wizards tried to help them, both the direct offspring and then their children and their children. They tried to cure them. Cure them? Cure them of what? Richard lifted his arms in a heated gesture of frustration, of being born ungifted, of being born without even that tiny spark of the gift like everyone else has. The wizards back then tried to restore the breaks in the link. How did they think they would be able to cure someone of not having even the spark of the gift? Richard pressed his lips together as he thought of a way to explain it. Well, you know the wizards who sent you across the boundary to find Zed? Yes, Kalin said in a suspicious drawl. They weren't born with the gift. Born wizards, that is. What were they, second or third wizards, something like that? You told me about them once. He snapped his fingers as it came to him. Wizards of the third order, right? Yes. Just one, Giller, was the second order. None were able to pass the tests to be a wizard of the first order, like Zed, because they didn't have the gift. Being wizards was their calling, but they weren't gifted in the conventional sense. But they still had that spark of the gift that everyone has. That's what I'm talking about, Richard said. They weren't born with the gift to be wizards, just the spark of it like everyone else. Yet Zed somehow trained them to be able to use magic, to be wizards, even though they weren't born that way, born with the gift to be wizards. Richard, that was a lifetime of work. I know. But the point is that Zed was able to help them to be wizards, at least wizards enough to pass his tests and conjure magic. Yes, I suppose. When I was young, they taught me about the workings of magic and the wizards keep about those people and creatures in the Midlands with magic. They may not have been born with the gift, but they had worked a lifetime to become wizards. They were wizards, she insisted. Richard's mouth turned up with the kind of smile that told her that she had just framed the essence of his argument for him. But they had not been born with that aspect, that attribute of the gift. He leaned toward her. Zed, besides training them, must have used magic to help them become wizards, right? Kalin frowned at the thought. I don't know. They never told me about their training to become wizards. That was never germane to their relationship with me or my training. But Zed has additive magic, Richard pressed. Additive can change things, add to them, make them more than they are. All right, Kalin cautiously agreed. What's the point? The point is that Zed took people who weren't born with the gift to be wizards, and he trained them, but, more importantly, he must have also used his power to help them along that path by altering how they were born. He had to have added to their gift to make them more than they were born to be. Richard glanced over at her as his horse stepped around a small, scraggly pine. He altered people with magic. Kalin let out a deep breath as she looked away from Richard and ahead at the gentle spread of grassy hills to either side of them as she tried to fully grasp the concept of what he was saying. I never considered that before, but all right, she finally said. So what of it? We thought that only the wizards of old could do such a thing, but apparently it's not a lost art, nor would it be entirely so far-fetched as I had imagined for the wizards back then to believe they could change what was into what they thought it ought to be. What I'm saying is that like what Zed did to give people that with which they were not born, so too did the wizards of old try to give people born as pillars of creation a spark of the gift. Kalin felt a chill of realization. The implication was staggering. 
Not just the wizards of old, but Zed, too, had used magic to alter the very nature of people, the very nature of what they were, how they were born. She supposed that he had only helped them to achieve what was their greatest ambition in life, their calling, by enhancing what they already had been born with. He helped them to reach their full potential. But that was for men who had the innate potential. While the wizards of long ago probably had done similar things to help people, they had also sometimes used their power for less benevolent reasons. So, he said, the wizards back then who were experienced in altering people's abilities thought that these people called the pillars of creation could be cured. Cured of not having been born gifted, she said in a flat tone of incredulity. Not exactly. They weren't trying to make them into wizards, but they thought they could at least be cured of not having that infinitesimal spark of the gift that simply enabled them to interact with magic. Kalen took a purging breath. So then what happened? This book was written after the Great War had ended, after the barrier had been created and the old world had been sealed away. It was written after the new world was at peace, or at least after the barrier kept the old world contained. But remember what we found out before? That we think that during the war, Wizard Ricker and his team had done something to halt subtractive magic's ability to be passed on to the offspring of wizards? Well, after the war, those born with the gift started becoming increasingly uncommon, and those who were being born were being born without the subtractive side. So, after the war, she said, those who were born with the gift of both additive and subtractive were rapidly becoming non-existent. We already knew that. Right. Richard leaned toward her and lifted the book. But then, when there are fewer wizards being born, all of a sudden the wizards additionally realize that they have all these pristinely ungifted breaks all together in the link to magic on their hands. Suddenly, on top of the problem of the birth rate of those with the gift to be wizards dropping, they were faced with what they called pillars of creation. Kalen swayed in the saddle as she thought about it, trying to imagine the situation at the keep at the time. I can see that they would have been pretty concerned. His voice lowered meaningfully. They were desperate. Kalen laid her reins over, moving in behind Richard as his horse stepped around an ancient fallen tree that had been bleached silver from the sweltering sun. So I suppose, Kalen asked as she walked her horse back up beside him, that the wizard started to do the same thing Zed did? Train those who had the calling? Those who wished to be wizards but had not been born with the gift? Yes, but back then, Richard said, they trained those with only additive to be able to use the subtractive too, like full wizards of the time. As time went on, though, even that was being lost to them, and they were only able to do what Zed did, train men to be wizards, but they could only wield additive magic. But that isn't really what the book is about, Richard said as he gestured dismissively. That was just a side point to record what they had attempted. They started out with confidence. They thought that these pillars of creation could be cured of being pristinely ungifted, much like wizards with only additive could be trained to use both sides of the magic, and those without the gift for wizardry could be made wizards able to use at least the additive side of it. The way he used his hands when he talked reminded her of the way Zed did when he became worked up. They tried to modify the very nature of how these people had been born. They tried to take people without any spark of the gift and alter them in a desperate attempt to give them the ability to interact with magic. They weren't just adding or enhancing, they were trying to create something out of nothing. Kalin didn't like the sound of that. They knew that in those ancient times the wizards had great power, and they altered people with the gift manipulated their gift to suit a specific purpose. They created weapons out of people. In the Great War, Jagang's ancestors were one such weapon, dreamwalkers. Dreamwalkers were created to be able to take over the minds of people in the New World and control them. 
Out of desperation, the bond of the Lord Rawl was created to counter that weapon, to protect people from the Dreamwalkers. Any number of human weapons were conjured from the gifted. Such changes were often profound, and they were irrevocable. At times, the creations were monsters of boundless cruelty. From this heritage, Jagang had been born. During that great war, one of the wizards who had been put on trial for treason refused to reveal what damage he had done. When even torture failed to gain the man's confession, the wizards conducting the trial turned to the talents of a wizard named Merit and ordered the creation of a confessor. Magda Cirrus, the first confessor, extracted the man's confession. The tribunal was so pleased with the results of Wizard Merritt's conjuring that they commanded that an order of confessors be created. Kaylin felt no different than other people felt. She was no less human, no less a woman, loved life no less. But her confessor's power was the result of that conjuring. She too was a descendant of women altered to be weapons. In this case, weapons designed to find the truth. What's the matter? Richard asked. She glanced over and saw the look of concern on his face. Kaylin forced a smile and shook her head that it was nothing. So what is it that you discovered by jumping ahead in the book? Richard took a deep breath as he folded his hands over the pommel of the saddle. Essentially, they were attempting to use color in order to help people born without eyes to see. From Kalin's understanding of magic and of history, this was fundamentally different from even the most malevolent experiments to alter people into weapons. Even in the most vile of these instances, they were attempting to take away some attribute of their humanity and at the same time add to or enhance an elemental ability. In none of it were they trying to create that which was not there at all. In other words, Kalin summed up, they failed. Richard nodded. So here they were. The great war was long over, and the old world, those who had wanted to end magic, much like the imperial order, was safely sealed away beyond the barrier that had been created. Now they find out that the birth rate of those carrying the gift of wizardry is plummeting, and that the magic engendered by the House of Rawl, the bond with his people designed to stop the Dreamwalkers from taking them, has an unexpected consequence. It also gives birth to the pristinely ungifted who are an irreversible break in the lineage of magic. They have two problems then, Kalin said. They have fewer wizards being born to deal with problems of magic, and they have people being born with no link at all to the magic. That's right. And the second problem was growing faster than the first. In the beginning, they thought they would find a solution, a cure. They didn't. Worse, as I explained before, those born of the pristinely ungifted, like Jensen, always bear children the same as they. In a few generations, the number of the people without the link to the gift was growing faster than anyone ever expected. Kalin let out a deep breath. Desperate indeed. It was becoming chaos. She hooked a loose strand of hair back. What did they decide? Richard regarded her with one of those looks that told her he was pretty disturbed by what he'd found. They chose magic over people. They deemed that this attribute, magic, or those who possessed it, was more important than human life. His voice rose. Here they took the very thing they fought the war over, the right of those who were born the way they were, in that case people born with magic, to their own lives, to exist, and they turned it all around to be that this attribute was more important than the life which held it. He let out a breath and lowered his voice. There were too many to execute, so they did the next best thing. They banished them. Kalin's eyebrows went up. Banished them? To where? Richard leaned toward her with fire in his eyes. The old world. What? Richard shrugged as if speaking on behalf of the wizards back then, mocking their reasoning. What else could they do? They could hardly execute them. They were friends and family. Many of those normal people with the spark of the gift, 
but who were not gifted as wizards or sorceresses and so didn't think of themselves as gifted, had sons, daughters, brothers, sisters, uncles, aunts, cousins, neighbors, who had married these pristinely ungifted, these pillars of creation. They were part of society, a society which was less and less populated by the truly gifted. In a society where they were increasingly outnumbered and mistrusted, the ruling gifted couldn't bring themselves to put all these tainted people to death. You mean they even considered it? Richard's eyes told her that they had, and what he thought of the notion. But in the end, they couldn't. At the same time, after trying everything, they now realized that they couldn't ever restore the link to magic once it was broken by these people, and such people were marrying and having children, and the children were marrying and having children, who in every case passed along this taint. And those so tainted were increasing in numbers faster than anyone had imagined. As far as the gifted were concerned, their very world was threatened, in much the same way it had been threatened by the war. That was, after all, what those in the old world had been trying to do, destroy magic. And here it was, the very thing they feared, happening. They couldn't repair the damage, they couldn't stop it from spreading, and they couldn't put to death all those among them. At the same time, with the taint multiplying, they knew that they were running out of time. So they settled on what to them was the only way out, banishment. And they could cross the barrier, she asked. Those with the gift, for all practical purposes, were prevented from crossing the barrier. But for those who were pillars of creation, magic did not exist. They were unaffected by it. So to them, the barrier was not an obstacle. How could those in charge be sure they had all the pillars of creation? If any escaped, the banishment would fail to solve their problem. Those with the gift, wizards and sorceresses, can somehow recognize those pristinely ungifted by what they are, holes in the world, as Jensen said those like her were called. The gifted can see them, but not sense them with their gift. Apparently it wasn't a problem to know who the pillars of creation were. Can you tell any difference? Kalin asked. Can you sense Jensen as being different, being a hole in the world? No, but I've not been taught to use my ability. How about you? Kaylin shook her head. I'm not a sorceress, so I guess that I don't have the ability to detect those like her. She shifted her weight in her saddle. So what happened with those people back then? The people of the New World collected all those ungifted offspring of the House of Rawl and their every single last descendant and sent the whole lot of them across the great barrier to the old world where the people had professed that they wanted mankind to be free of magic. Richard smiled with the irony, even of such a grim event as this. The wizards of the new world, in essence, gave their enemy in the old world exactly what they professed to want, what they had been fighting for, mankind without magic. His smile withered. Can you imagine deciding that we had to banish Jensen and send her into some fearful unknown simply because of the fact that she can't see magic? Kaylin shook her head as she tried to envision such a time. What a horror to be uprooted and sent away, especially to the enemy of your own people. Richard rode in silence for a time. Finally, he went on with the story. It was a terrifying event for those banished, but it was also traumatic, almost beyond endurance, to those who were left. Can you even imagine what it must have been like? All those friends and relatives suddenly ripped out of your life, your family? The disruption to trade and livelihood? Richard's words came with bitter finality. All because they decided some attribute was more important than human life. Just listening to the story, Kaylin felt as if she had been through an ordeal. She watched Richard riding beside her, staring off, lost in his own thoughts. Then what? she finally asked. Did they ever hear from those who were banished? He shook his head. No, nothing. They were now beyond the great barrier. They were gone. Kaylin stroked her horse's neck just to feel the comfort of something alive. What did they do about those who were born after that? 
Still, he stared off. Killed them. Kalen swallowed in revulsion. I can't imagine how they could do that. They could tell once the child was born if it was ungifted. It was said to be easier then, before it was named. Kaylin couldn't find her voice for a moment. Still, she said in a weak voice, I can't imagine it. It's no different from what confessors did about the birth of male confessors. His words cut through her. She hated the memory of those times, hated the memory of a male child being born to a confessor, hated the memory of them being put to death by command of the mother. There was said to be no choice. Male confessors in the past had had no self-control over their power. They became monsters, started wars, caused unimaginable suffering. It was argued that there was no choice but to put a male child of a confessor to death before they were named. Kaylin couldn't force herself to look up into Richard's eyes. The witch woman, Shota, had foretold that she and Richard would conceive a male child. Neither Kaylin nor Richard would ever for an instant consider harming any child of theirs, a child resulting from their love for one another, from their love of life. She couldn't imagine putting a child of theirs to death for being born a male child of her as a confessor or an ungifted male or female child of Richard for being a Rawl. How could anyone say that such a life had no right to exist because of who they were, what they were like, or what they might possibly become? Somewhere along the line after this book was written, Richard said in a quiet voice, things changed. When this book was written, the Lord Rawl of Dahara always married, and they knew when he produced an offspring. When the child was pristinely ungifted, they ended its life as mercifully as they could. At some point, ruling wizards of the House of Rawl became like Darken Rawl. They took any woman they wanted whenever they wanted. The details, such as if an ungifted child born of those couplings was actually a pillar of creation, became unimportant to them. They simply killed any offspring except the gifted heir. But they were wizards. They could have told which ones were like that and at least not killed the rest. If they wanted, I suppose they could have, but like Dark and Rawl, their only interest was in the single gifted heir. They simply killed the rest. So such offspring hid for fear of their life and one managed to escape the grasp of Dark and Rawl until you killed him first. And so you have a sister, Jensen. Richard's smile returned. And so I do. Kalin followed his gaze and saw distant specks, black-tipped races watching as they soared on the updrafts of the high cliffs of the mountains to the east. She took a purging breath of the hot, humid air. Richard, those ungifted offspring that were banished to the old world, do you think they survived? If the wizards in the old world didn't slaughter them. But everyone down here in the old world is the same as in the new world. I've fought against the soldiers from here, with Zed and the Sisters of the Light. We used magic of every sort to try to halt the Order's advance. I can tell you firsthand that all those from the old world are affected by magic. So that means they all are born with that spark of the gift. There are no broken links in the chain of magic in the old world. From everything I've seen down here, I'd have to agree. Kaylin wiped sweat from her brow. It was running into her eyes. So what happened to those banished people? Richard gazed off toward the mountains beneath the races. I can't imagine, but it must have been horrifying for them. So you think that maybe that was the end of them? That maybe they perished or were put to death? He regarded her with a sidelong glance. I don't know. But what I'd like to know is why that place back there is named the same as they were called in this book, the Pillars of Creation. His eyes took on a menacing gleam. And far worse yet, I'd like to know why, as Jensen told us, a copy of this book is among Jagang's most prized possessions. That troublesome thought had been running through Kalin's mind as well. She looked up at him from beneath a frown. Maybe you shouldn't have skipped ahead in your reading of the book, Lord Rahl. Richard's fleeting smile wasn't all she'd hoped for. I'll be relieved if that's the biggest mistake I've made lately. 
What do you mean? He raked his hair back. Is anything different about your confessor's power? Different? Almost involuntarily, his question caused her to draw back, to focus inwardly, to take stock of the force she always felt within herself. No, it feels the same as always. The power coiled in the core of her being did not need to be summoned when there was need of it. As always, it was there at the ready. It only required that she release her restraint of it for it to be unleashed. There's something wrong with the sword, he said, catching her by surprise. Wrong with its power. Kalin couldn't imagine what to make of such a notion. How can you tell? What's different? Richard idly stroked his thumbs along the reins turned back over his fingers. It's hard to define exactly what's different. I'm just used to the feeling of it being at my beck and call. It responds when I need it, but for some reason it seems to be hesitant about doing so. Kalin felt that now, more than ever, they needed to get back to Aidendril and see Zed. Zed was the keeper of the sword. Even though they couldn't take the sword through the sliff, Zed would be able to give them insight about any nuance of its power. He would know what to do. He would be able to help Richard with the headaches, too. And Kalin knew that Richard needed help. She could see that he wasn't himself. His gray eyes held a glaze of pain, but there was something more etched in his expression, in the way he moved, the way he carried himself. The whole explanation of the book and what he had discovered seemed to have sapped his strength. She was beginning to think that it wasn't she, after all, who was the one running out of time, but that it was Richard. That thought, despite the warm afternoon sun, sent cold terror racing through her. Richard checked the others over his shoulder. Let's go back to the wagon. I need to get something warmer to put on. It's freezing today. Chapter 12 Zed peered up the deserted street. He could have sworn that he saw someone. Using his gift to search for any sign of life told him that there was no one anywhere around. Still, he remained motionless as he stared. The warm breeze pressed his simple robes against his bony frame and gently ruffled his disheveled white hair. A tattered, sun-faded blue dress that someone had pinned to a second-floor balcony railing to dry flapped like a flag in the wind. The dress, along with a city full of personal possessions, had long ago been left behind. The buildings, their walls painted various colors from a rusty red to yellow, with shutters in bright contrasting hues, stuck out to slightly varying degrees on either side of the narrow cobbled street making a canyon of colorful walls. Most of the second stories overhung the bottom floors by a few feet, and with their eaves hanging out even more, the buildings closed off the better part of the sky, except for a snaking slit of afternoon sunlight that followed the sinuous course of the street up and over the gentle hill. The doors were all tightly shut, most of the windows shuttered. A pale green gate to an alleyway hung open, squeaking as it swung to and fro in the breeze. Zed decided that it must have been a trick of the light that he'd seen, maybe a window pane that had moved in the wind, sending a flicker of light across a wall. When he was at last sure that he had been mistaken about seeing anyone, Zed started back down the street, yet remained close to one side, walking as quietly as possible. The Imperial Order army had not returned to the city since Zed had unleashed the light web that had killed an enormous number of their force, but that didn't mean that there couldn't be dangers about. No doubt Emperor Jagang still wanted the city, and especially the keep, but he was no fool, and he knew that a few more light webs ignited among his army, no matter how vast it was, would in an instant reduce his force by such staggering numbers that it could alter the course of the war. Jagang had fought against the Midland and Daharan forces for a year, and in all those battles he had not lost as many men as he'd lost in that one blinding moment. He would not casually risk another such event. After such a blow, Jagang would want to capture the keep more than he had ever wanted it before. He would want Zed more than ever before. 
Had Zed more of the light webs like the one his frantic search through the keep had turned up, he would have already unleashed them all on the order. He sighed. If only he had more. Still, Jagang didn't know that he had no more such constructed spells. As long as Jagang feared that there were more, it served Zed's purpose in keeping the Imperial Order out of Aedendril and away from the wizard's keep. Some harm had been done to the Confessor's palace when Jagang had been gulled into attacking, but Zed judged that trying that trick had been worth the regrettable damage. It had almost netted him and Addy the Emperor's hide. Damage could always be repaired. He vowed that it would be repaired. Zed clenched a fist at how close he had come to finishing Jagang that day. At least he had dealt a mighty blow to his army. And Zed might have had Jagang had it not been for that strange young woman. He shook his head at the memory of actually seeing one who could not be touched by magic. He'd known in theory of their existence, but had never before known it for certain to be true. Vague references in old books made for interesting abstract speculation, but seeing it with his own eyes was quite something else. It had been an unsettling sight. Addie had been shaken by the encounter even more than he. She was blind, yet with the aid of the gift could see better than he could. That day she had not been able to see the young woman who was there, but in some ways not there. To Zed's eyes, if not his gift, she was a beautiful sight, with some of Darken Rawl's looks, but different and altogether captivating. That she was half-sister to Richard was clear. She shared some of his features, especially the eyes. If only Zed could have stopped her, kept her out of the way, convinced her that she was making a terrible mistake by being with the Order, or even if he could have killed her, Jagang would not have escaped justice. Still, Zed held no illusions about ending the threat of the Imperial Order simply by killing Jagang. Jagang was merely the brute who led other brutes in enforcing blind faith in the Order. A blind faith that embraced death as salvation from what it preached was the corrupt misery of life. A blind faith in which life itself had no value but as a bloody sacrifice upon the altar of altruism. A blind faith that blamed the failure of its own ideas on mankind for being wicked and for failing to offer sufficient sacrifice in an endless quest for some elusive greater good that grew ever more distant. A blind faith in an order that clung to power by feeding off the carcasses of the productive lives it ruined. A faith that by its very beliefs rejected reason and embraced the irrational could not long endure without intimidation and force, without brutes like Jagang to enforce such faith. While Emperor Jagang was brutally effective, it was a mistake to think that if Jagang were to die that very day, it would end the threat of the Order. It was the Order's ideas that were so dangerous. The priests of the Order would find other brutes. The only real way to end the Order's reign of terror was to expose the naked evil of its teachings to the light of truth and for those suffering under its doctrines to throw off the Order's yoke. Until then, they would have to fight the Imperial Order back as best they could, hoping at least to eventually contain them. Zed poked his head around a corner, watching, listening, sniffing the wind for any trace of anyone who might be lurking about. The city was deserted, but on a number of occasions, stray Imperial Order soldiers had wandered in out of the mountains. After the destruction caused by the light web, panic had swept through the Order's encampment. Many soldiers had scattered to the hills. Once the army had regrouped, a large number of men had decided to desert instead of returning to their units. Tens of thousands of such deserters were rounded up and executed, their bodies left to rot as a warning of what happened to those who abandoned the cause of the greater glory of the Imperial Order, or, as the Order liked to put it, the cause of the greater good. Most of the rest of the men who had run to the hills had then had a change of heart and straggled back into camp. There were still some, though, who had not wanted to go back and had not been caught. For a time, 
After Jagang's army had moved on, they had wandered into the city, sometimes alone, sometimes in small groups, half starved to search for food and to loot. Zed had lost count of how many such men he had killed. He was reasonably sure that all of those stragglers were dead now. The order was made up of men mostly from cities and towns. Such men weren't used to living in the wild. Their job was to overwhelm the enemy, to kill, rape, terrorize, and plunder. A whole corps of logistics personnel provided them with support, delivering and dispensing a constant stream of supplies that rolled in to feed and care for the soldiers. They were violent men, but they were men who needed to be tended, who depended on the group for their survival. They didn't last long on their own in the trackless forested mountains surrounding Adendril. But Zed hadn't seen any of them for quite some time. He was reasonably sure that the stragglers had starved, been killed, or had long ago headed back south to the old world. There was always the possibility, though, that Jagang had sent assassins to Adendril. Some of those assassins could be Sisters of the Light, or worse, Sisters of the Dark. For that reason, Zed rarely left the safety of the keep, and when he did, he was cautious. Two, he hated poking around the city, seeing it so devoid of life. This had been his home for much of his life. He remembered the days when the keep was a hub of activity, not as it once had been, he knew, but alive with people of all sorts. He found himself smiling at the memory. His smile faded. Now the city was a joyless sight, forlorn without people filling the streets, people talking from one balcony to a neighbor across the street in another window, people gathering to trade goods in the market. Not so long ago, men would have stopped to have conversations in doorways while vendors pulled carts of their wares along the narrow streets and children at play skipped through the throngs. Zed sighed at the sad sight of such lifeless streets. At least those lives were safe, if a long way from home. Although he had many fundamental differences with the Sisters of the Light, he knew that their prelate, Verna, and the rest of the Free Sisters would watch over them. The only problem was that now that Jagang had nothing in Adendril of any real value to conquer except the keep, and much to lose, he had wheeled his army east toward the remnants of the Midland forces. To be sure, the Daharan army waited across those mountains to the east, and Zed knew how formidable they were, but he couldn't fool himself that they stood a chance against a force as immense as the Imperial Order. Jagang had left the city in order to go after those Daharan forces. The Imperial Order could not win the war by occupying an empty city. They needed to crush any resistance once and for all so that there would be no people left who could, by living prosperous, happy, peaceful lives, put the lie to the Order's teachings. Now that Jagang had come all the way up through the Midlands, he had cleaved the New World. Forces had been left all along the route to occupy cities and towns. Now the main force of the Order would turn its bloodlust east on a lone Dahara. By dividing the New World in such a way, Jagang would be able to more efficiently crush opposition. Zed knew that it wasn't for lack of trying that the New World had given ground. He and Kalin, among a great many others, had worked themselves sick month after month trying to find a way to stop Jagang's forces. Zed clutched his robes at his throat, at the painful memory of such ferocious fighting, at how nothing had worked against Jagang's numbers, at the death and dying, at the friends he had lost. It was only a matter of time until all was lost to the hordes from the old world. Richard and Kalin would not survive such a conquest by the Imperial Order. Zed's thin fingers covered his trembling lips at the ghastly thought of them being lost, too. They were the only family he had left. They were everything to him. Zed felt a crushing wave of hopelessness and had to sit on the stump of a log section set outside a shoe shop that had been boarded closed. Once the Imperial Order finally annihilated all opposition, Jagang would return to take the city and lay siege to the keep. Sooner or later, he would have it all. 
The future, as Zed imagined it, seemed to be a world shrouded in the gray pall of life under the Imperial Order. If the world fell under that pall, it would probably be a very long time before mankind ever emerged to live free again. Once liberty was surrendered to tyranny, it could be smothered for centuries before its flames again sprang to life and brightened the world. Zed hadn't sat for long when he forced himself to his feet. He was first wizard. He had been in hopeless straits before and had seen the foe turn back. There was still the possibility that he and Addy could find something in the keep that would aid them, or that they might yet discover information in the libraries that would give them a valuable advantage. As long as there was life, they could fight on toward their goal. They still had the ability to triumph. He harumphed to himself. They would triumph. Zed was glad that Addy wasn't with him to see him in such a sorry state that he would have, if even momentarily, considered defeat. Addy would have never let him hear the end of it, and deservedly so. He harumphed again. He was hardly inexperienced, hardly without the wherewithal to handle challenges that arose. And if there were assassins about, gifted or not, they would find themselves caught up by one of the many little surprises he had left around. Very nasty surprises. Chin up, Zed smiled to himself as he turned down a narrow alley, making his way past a patchwork of yards with emptied pens that had once held chickens, geese, ducks, and pigeons. His gaze passed over small back courtyards, their herbs and flowers growing untended, their wash lines empty, their wood and other materials stacked to the sides, waiting for people to return and work them into something useful. Along the way, he stopped in various vegetable gardens, harvesting the volunteer crops that had sprung up. There was lettuce aplenty, spinach, some small squash, green tomatoes, and still a few peas. He collected his bounty in a canvas sack and slung it over a shoulder as he walked the garden plots, checking on the progress of irregular patches of onions, beets, beans, and turnips. Still some growing to do, he concluded. While the vegetables weren't thick from a careful planting, the random growths in yards all over the city meant that he and Addie would have fresh vegetables for some time to come. Maybe she might even take to putting some things up for next winter. They could store root crops in the colder places in the keep and preserve more perishable vegetables. They would have more food than they could eat. On his way up the alley, Zed spied a bush off toward the corner, sprawled green and lush over a short back fence between two homes. The blackberry bush was loaded with ripe berries. He paused occasionally to check up and down the streets beyond while he made a nice-sized pile of the dark, plump berries in a square of cloth, then tied it up and placed it atop the heavier goods in his sack. There were still plenty of ripe berries, and he hated to let them go to waste or to the birds, so he worked at filling his pockets. He didn't worry that it would spoil his dinner. It was a long walk back up the mountain to the wizard's keep, so he could use a snack. Addy was making a thick stew from cured ham. There was no danger that he would spoil his appetite on mere berries. She would be pleased by the vegetables he brought and would no doubt want to add them to the stew straight away. Addy was a wonderful cook, although he dared not admit it to her lest she get a big head. Before the stone bridge, Zed paused, gazing back down the wide road leading up the mountainside. Only the wind in the trees and their shimmering leaves created any sound or movement. For a long moment, though, he stared down at the empty road. Finally, he turned back to the bridge that in less than 300 paces spanned a chasm with near vertical sides dropping away for thousands of feet. Clouds far below hung hard against the sheer rock walls. Despite the countless times he had walked over the stone bridge, it still made him feel just a little queasy. Without wings, though, there was but this single way into the keep, except for the little trick passage he had used as a boy. Because of their strategic role, Zed had placed enough snares and traps along the bridge and the rest of the road up to the keep 
that no one was going to live for more than a few paces once they came close. Not even a sister of the dark could trespass here. A few sisters had attempted the impossible and had paid with their lives. They would have suspected such webs laid by the first wizard himself and felt some of the warning shields, but no doubt Jagang had given them no choice in the matter and had sent them to attempt entry, sacrificing their lives for the greater good of the order. Verna had once briefly been taken captive by the Dreamwalker, and she had told Zed all about the experience in the hope that they might find a counter, other than swearing loyalty in one's heart to the Lord Rall, and thereby invoking the protection of the bond. Zed had tried, but there was no counter magic he could provide. In the Great War, wizards far more talented than he, and with both sides of the gift, had tried to devise defenses against Dreamwalkers. Once the Dreamwalker had taken over a person's mind, there was no defense. You had to do his bidding, regardless of the cost, even if the cost was your life. Zed suspected that for a few, death was a coveted release from the agony of possession by the Dreamwalker. Suicide was a course blocked by Jagang. He needed the talents of the sisters and other gifted. He couldn't have them all kill themselves for release from the misery of life as his chattel. But if he sent them to their certain death, such as attempting to enter the keep, then they could at last be free of the agony that had become their life. Ahead, the keep towered on the mountainside. The soaring walls of dark stone, intimidating to most people, offered Zed the warm sense of home. His eyes roamed the ramparts, and he remembered strolling there with his wife so many years ago, a lifetime ago, it seemed. From the towers he had often looked down at the beautiful sight of Aidendril below. He had once marched across the bridges and passageways to deliver orders, defending the Midlands from an invasion from Dahara, led by Darken Rall's father. That, too, seemed a lifetime ago. Now Richard, his grandson, was the Lord Rall, and had succeeded in uniting most of the Midlands under the rule of the Daharan Empire. Zed shook his head at the wonder of it, at the thought of how Richard had changed everything. By Richard's hand, Zed was now a subject of the Daharan Empire. What a wonder indeed! Before he reached the far side of the bridge, Zed glanced down into the chasm. Movement caught his attention. Putting his bony fingers on the rough stone, he leaned out a little for a look. Below, but above the clouds, he saw two huge birds, black as moonless midnight, gliding along through the split in the mountain. Zed had never seen the like of them. He couldn't imagine what to make of the sight. When he turned back to the keep, he thought he saw three more of the same kind of large black birds flying together high above the keep. He decided that they had to be ravens. Ravens were big. He must simply be misjudging the distance, probably from lack of food. Concluding that they had to be ravens, he tried to adjust his estimation of their distance, but they were already gone. He glanced down, but didn't see the other two either. As he passed under the iron portcullis, feeling the warm embrace of the keep's spell, Zed felt a wave of loneliness. He so missed Erolyn, his long-dead wife, as well as his long-past daughter, Richard's mother, and dear spirits, he missed Richard. He smiled then, thinking of Richard being with his own wife now. It was still sometimes hard for him to think of Richard as grown into a man. He had had a wondrous time helping to raise Richard. What a time that had been in his life off in Westland, away from the Midlands, away from magic and responsibility, with just that ever-curious boy and a whole world of wonders to explore and show him. What a time indeed. Inside the keep, lamps along the wall obediently sprang to flame as first wizard Zedekus Zul Zarander made his way along passageways and through grand rooms, deeper into the immense mountain fortress. As he passed the webs he'd placed, he checked the texture of their magic to find that they were undisturbed. He sighed in relief. He didn't expect that anyone would be foolish enough to try to enter the keep, but the world had fools to spare. 
He didn't really like leaving such dangerous webs cast all about the place, in addition to the often dangerous shields already guarding the keep, but he dared not relax his guard. As he passed a long side table in a towering gathering hall, Zed, as he had done since he was a boy, ran his finger along the smooth groove in the edge of the variegated chocolate brown marble top. He stopped, frowning down at the table, and realized that it contained something he suddenly felt the want of, a ball of fine black cord left there years ago to tie ribbons and other decorations on the lamp brackets in the gathering hall to mark the harvest festival. Sure enough, in the center drawer, he found the ball of fine cord. He snatched it up and slipped it into a pocket long emptied of its load of berries. From the wall bracket beside the table, he lifted a wand with six small bells. The wand, one of hundreds if not thousands throughout the keep, was once used to summon servants. He sighed inwardly. It had been decades since servants and their families last lived in the wizard's keep. He remembered their children running and playing in the halls. He remembered the joy of laughter echoing throughout the keep, bringing life to the place. Zed told himself that one day children would again run and laugh in the halls. Richard and Kalen's children. Zed's broad smile stretched his cheeks. There were windows and openings in the stone that let light spill into many halls and rooms, but there were other places less well lit. Zed found one of those darker places that was dim enough to satisfy him. He stretched a piece of the black cord, strung with one of the bells, across the doorway, winding it around coarse stone molding to each side. Moving deeper through the labyrinth of halls and passageways, he stopped and strung more strings with a bell at places where it would be hard to see. He had to collect several more of the servant wands for a supply of bells. Although there were shields of magic laced everywhere, there was no telling what powers some of the Sisters of the Dark possessed. They would be looking for magic, not bells. It couldn't hurt to take the extra precaution. Zed made mental notes of where he strung the fine black cord. He would have to let Addie know. He doubted, though, that with her gifted sight she would need the warning. He was sure that with her blind eyes she could see better than anyone. Following the wonderful aroma of ham stew, Zed made his way to the comfortable room lined with bookshelves they used most of the time. Addie had hung spices to dry from the low beams carved with ancient designs. A leather couch sat before a broad fireplace and comfortable chairs beside a silver inlaid table placed in front of a diamond patterned leaded window with a breathtaking view overlooking Aidendrill. The sun was setting, leaving the city below bathed in a warm light. It almost looked like it always did, except there was no telltale smoke curling up from cooking fires. Zed set his burlap sack loaded with his harvest on piles of books atop a round mahogany table behind the couch. He shuffled closer to the fire, all the while taking deep breaths to inhale the intoxicating aroma of the stew. Addie, he called, this smells delightful. Have you looked outside today? I saw the oddest birds. He smiled as he inhaled another whiff. Addie, I think it must be done by now, he called toward the doorway to the side pantry room. I think we ought to taste it at least. Can't hurt to check, you know. Zed glanced back over his shoulder. Addie, are you listening to me? He went to the doorway and peered into the pantry, but it was empty. Addie, he called down the stairs at the back of the pantry. Are you down there? Zed's mouth twisted with discontentment when she didn't answer. Addie, he called again. Bags, woman, where are you? He turned back, peering at the stew bubbling in the kettle hung on the crane over the fire. Zed scooped up a long wooden spoon from a pantry cupboard. Spoon in hand, he stopped and leaned back toward the stairs. Take your time, Addie. I'll just be up here reading. Zed grinned and hurried for the stew. Chapter 13
Richard rose up in a rush when he saw Kara marching up a ravine toward camp, pushing ahead of her a man Richard vaguely recognized. In the failing light, he couldn't make out the man's face. Richard scanned the surrounding flat washes, rocky hills, and steep tree-covered slopes beyond, but didn't see anyone else. Friedrich was off to the south and Tom to the west, checking the surrounding country as Kara had been, to be sure there was no one about and that it was a safe place to spend the night. They were exhausted from picking a sinuous route through the increasingly rugged country. Kara had been checking north, the direction they were headed, and the direction Richard considered potentially the most dangerous. Jensen turned from the animals, waiting to see who the moored Sith had with her. Once on his feet, Richard wished he hadn't gotten up quite so quickly. Doing so made him lightheaded. He couldn't seem to shake the odd, disconnected sensation he felt, as if he were watching someone else react, talk, move. When he concentrated, forcing himself to focus his attention, the feeling would sometimes drift at least partly away, and he would begin to wonder if it was only his imagination. Kaylin's hand slipped up on his arm, gripping him as if she thought he might fall. Are you all right? she whispered. He nodded as he watched Kara and the man as he also kept an eye on the surrounding countryside. By the end of their ride earlier that afternoon to discuss the book, Kalin had become even more worried about him. They were both troubled about what he'd read, but Kalin was far more concerned, at the moment anyway, about him. Richard suspected that he might be coming down with a slight fever. That would explain why he was feeling so cold when everyone else was hot. From time to time, Kalin would feel his forehead or place the back of her hand against his cheek. Her touch warmed his heart. She ignored his smiles as she fretted over him. She thought that he might be slightly feverish. Once, she had Jensen feel his forehead to see if she thought he might be warmer than he should be. Jensen, too, thought that if he did have a fever, it was minor. Kara, so far, had been satisfied by Kalin's report that he didn't feel feverish and hadn't deemed it necessary to see for herself. A fever was just about the last thing Richard needed. There were important... important something. He couldn't seem to recall at the moment. He concentrated on trying to remember the young man's name, or at least where he'd seen him before. The last rays of the setting sun cast a pink glow across the mountains to the east. The closer hills were dimming to a soft gray in the gathering dusk. As darkness approached, the low fire was beginning to tint everything close around it to a warm yellow-orange. Richard had kept the cook fire small, not wanting it to signal their location any more than necessary. Lord Rawl, the man said in a reverent tone as he stepped into camp. He dipped his head forward in a hesitant bow, apparently not sure if it was proper to bow or not. It's an honor to see you again. He was perhaps a couple of years younger than Richard, with curly black hair that brushed the broad shoulders of his buckskin tunic. He wore a long knife at his belt, but no sword. His ears stuck out to the sides of his head as if he were straining to listen to every little sound. Richard imagined that as a boy he'd probably endured a lot of taunts about his ears, but now that he was a man, his ears made him look rather intent and serious. As muscular as the man was, Richard doubted that he still had to contend with taunts. I'm... I'm sorry, but I can't quite seem to recall... Oh, no, you wouldn't remember me, Lord Rawl. I was only... Sabar, Richard said as it came to him. Sabar, you loaded the furnaces in Prisca's foundry back in Alturang. Sabar beamed. That's right. I can't believe you remember me. Sabar had been one of the men at the foundry able to have work because of the supplies Richard hauled to Prisca when no one else could. Sabar had understood how hard Prisca worked just to keep his foundry alive under the oppressive, endless, and contradictory mandates of the order. Sabar had been there the day the statue Richard carved had been unveiled. He had seen it before it was destroyed. He had been there at the beginning of the revolution in Altur Rang, fighting close alongside Victor, Prisca, and all the others who had seized the moment when it was upon them. 
Sabar had fought to help gain freedom for himself, his friends, and for his city. That had been a day everything had changed. Even though this man, like many others, had been a subject of the imperial order, one of the enemy, he wanted to live his own life under just laws rather than under the dictates of despots who extinguished any hope of bettering oneself under the crushing burden of the cruel illusion of a greater good. Richard noticed then that everyone was standing in tense anticipation as if they had expected this to be trouble. Richard smiled at Kara. It's all right, I know him. So he told me, Kara said. She put a hand on Sabar's shoulder and pushed him down. Have a seat. Yes, Richard said, glad to see that Kara had been fairly amiable about it. Sit down and tell us why you're here. Nietzsche sent me. Richard rose again in a rush, Kalen coming up right beside him. Nietzsche, we're on our way to meet her. 